the man known to history as Saddam Hussein, was born on the 28th of April, 1937, in the small village of al Auja near Tikrit, to the northwest of the city of Baghdad in Iraq. His father, Hussein Abd al-Majid, was a peasant sheep herder. Some accounts state that he abandoned his family before Saddam was ever born, though it is more likely that he died from throat cancer in the winter of 1936 or 1937. He was a member of the Albu Nasir tribe, which had migrated to Iraq from Yemen in the southwest of the Arabian Peninsula, generations earlier. Saddam's mother was Suba Tulfa al-Musalat. Her family hailed from a more esteemed lineage, an ancestor having been Talfa ibn Musalat, a grandson of the Emir Omar Bey III of Tikrit, a former governor of the region. Years before Saddam was born, she and Hussein had another son, who appears to have died shortly before Saddam arrived in 1937. Subha subsequently remarried to Ibrahim al-Hassan Muhammad, and through this union, Saddam had several half-siblings. However, he saw little of them. Saddam's mother had attempted to terminate her pregnancy when her first husband died, and when Saddam was born, she never warmed to her son. Saddam's youth was troubled by his difficult familial background. His stepfather was a tough disciplinarian, who physically beat him during his childhood to such an extent that Saddam absconded from his family home as a child and went to live with an uncle who resided in Baghdad, the capital of Iraq. There he attended the al Ka Secondary School in Baghdad. He was a relatively decent student, and he would eventually move on to begin studying law. His uncle, Khair al-Talfa, was a major influence on him during these years. But Saddam never forgot his links to Tikrit, and many years later, when he emerged as the ruler of Iraq, he would promote his extended family members there to positions of considerable importance and authority. Hussein grew up during a period of immense change, not just in what is now modern-day Iraq, but across the Middle East. Most of the region had been ruled since the 16th century by a handful of powerful Islamic empires, specifically the Ottoman Empire or the Persians. Iraq and the regions to the north, west and south of it in what are now Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia had been controlled by the Ottomans. Their control over these territories was already declining rapidly by the early 20th century, but the entry of the Ottoman Empire into the First World War on the side of the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary led to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire by 1918. In the aftermath of the conflict, the victorious powers in the war, Britain and France, effectively divided up the Middle East between themselves and ruled the region through a series of mandates. These mandates created new nations that incorporated little of the regional differences and identities that characterized the area. Rather, groups were forced together based on the lines drawn in the desert sands by British and French policymakers. Nominal independence was granted to the Kingdom of Iraq under King Faisal I in 1932. But in reality, Britain retained enormous control over Iraq, including management of its large oil fields through the Iraqi Petroleum Company, a largely British-controlled entity. This situation still prevailed when the Second World War broke out, when Saddam was two years old. Many political groups within countries like Iraq conspired with the Nazis during the conflict, wishing to end British involvement in Iraq. They viewed the Iraqi monarchy as effectively complicit with Britain due to their continued support of the British Empire. It is not possible to understand Saddam's rise and the politics of Iraq in the second half of the 20th century without assessing the emergence of the Ba'ath Party which emerged in Syria in 1947. Its platform of pan-Arabism and anti-imperialism meant that it soon spread to other Middle Eastern countries, 
notably Iraq, where a branch was set up in 1951. Saddam's uncle Hayrala was an early member. From its inception, the party was associated primarily with the Sunni strand of Islam in Iraq, one of the two dominant strands of Islam, the other being Shia. However, Ba'athism was not a religious or theological movement. Indeed, in espousing socialism and a new way of running the Arab world, it largely rejected the dominance of religion throughout the region. Instead, Ba'athism espoused the idea that each Muslim state in the Middle East should attempt to rid itself of the vestiges of imperialism and act in conjunction with each other to restore the Arab people to a place of prominence and power in the world, such as had been enjoyed centuries earlier at the height of the Muslim empires. To this end, they were generally opposed to the governments which had been put in place in countries like Iraq and Syria as the British and French ended mandate rule in the interwar period. This set the Ba'ath party in Iraq on a collision course with the Iraqi monarchy and government as it existed in the aftermath of the Second World War. Saddam joined the Iraqi Ba'ath party in 1957 when he was 20 years of age. At that time, the party was a relatively small movement, barely constituting more than a few hundred members in Baghdad and a few of the other large towns. But events in Iraq were about to take a significant turn around the time that Saddam began taking a major interest in the country's politics. By the mid-1950s, the country had become a hotbed of political dissent, in large part owing to the incompetence of King Faisal II and his ministers, and also as Iraqis looked to the examples of countries like Egypt, where in 1952 officers within the military had overthrown King Farouk and established a new regime which sought to end British influence in the country, which, like in Iraq, had never fully ended, especially around the Suez Canal. In many ways, the 14th of July Revolution of 1958 in Iraq was a very similar occurrence to the Egyptian Revolution of 1952. During the Iraqi Revolution, commanders within the Iraqi military, such as Abdul Salam Arif and Abd al-Karim Hassim, led a coup d'etat beginning on the 14th of July 1958, which overthrew the government of King Faisal II. The monarch and several members of his family were murdered. The government was taken over in the space of a few hours and a new Iraqi republic was proclaimed. Despite its rather modest size, the Ba'ath party had sufficient connections within Baghdad's politics that a handful of its more prominent members were involved in forming a new government under the army colonels in the summer and autumn of 1958. Consequently, while he was an unknown 21-year-old at this juncture, Hussein was nevertheless on the fringes of the country's high politics by the late 1950s. The government, which was formed in 1958, was wholly unstable. There were numerous different parties and entities competing for power, many of them rapidly opposed to the others. For instance, the Iraqi Communist Party quickly emerged as a strong antagonist of the Ba'ath Party, while Hassim, the army commander who had led the 14th of July Revolution and who was the effective head of state of the new republic, was unwilling to join the United Arab Republic, an instrument of pan-Arabism which had been established by Egypt and resulted in a political union with Syria for several years. The Ba'athists were furious at Hassim's unwillingness in this regard and determined to assassinate him. Saddam was chosen as one of the assassins. They struck on the 7th of October, 1959, as Hassim was traveling in a car through Al Rashid Street in Baghdad. But despite Hassim being shot twice, the bullets hit him in the arm and shoulder, and he survived the attack. It has been speculated that the attack failed because Saddam began firing too early. He was shot in the leg himself by Hassim's security detail during the assassination attempt, but escaped from the scene. In the aftermath of the failed assassination attempt, the would-be assassins were smuggled out of Iraq to Syria, where Saddam quickly joined the Syrian branch of the Ba'ath Party. 
Back home in Iraq, several individuals were arrested in connection with the failed assassination attempt and show trials were carried out. For a time, Saddam relocated to Egypt and continued his law studies at the University of Cairo, though he would never complete his degree. He was there in 1963 when two coups occurred to the east. In March of that year, a branch of the military in Syria, which was controlled by the Ba'ath Party, launched a coup d'etat, which resulted in the establishment of Ba'athist Syria. Eight years later, one of the military officers involved, Hafez al-Assad, would rise to rule Ba'athist Syria. The al-Assad family has continued to control Syria to the present. This was preceded weeks earlier by the Ramadan revolution in Iraq, when elements within the Iraqi army, led by the Ba'athists, overthrew Qasim's government and seized power. However, they only held power for nine months before one of Qasim's former allies from the 1958 coup, Abdul Salim Arif, seized power in Baghdad and purged the Ba'athists from the government. By the time the counter-coup of November 1963 occurred, Saddam was back in Iraq, having left Egypt shortly after his party came to power the previous February. Following the November 1963 coup and the purging of the Ba'athists, he elected to remain in Iraq and continued to operate in the capital with cells of the remaining Ba'athist party members. He was duly arrested in 1964 and found guilty of involvement with a prohibited political party, for which he was sent to jail for several years. Saddam was also implicated in a plot to kill Arif, and this led to his imprisonment in October 1964. However, his stint in prison would be shorter lived than the Iraqi state had intended. He escaped after just two years of his sentence in 1966. It was from this juncture that Saddam, now nearing his 30th year, began to rise within the Iraqi Ba'athist movement. Shortly after his prison escape, he was appointed as a regional commander of the party, one who was quickly acknowledged to be a good organizer, who could grow the party even during a period when schisms were emerging within it, concerning the level of involvement which it should continue to have with the Soviet Union and other Marxist-Leninist states. By this time, Saddam was also married and starting a family. In 1963, shortly after his return from Egypt, but before his arrest and imprisonment, he had married Sajida Talfa, his first cousin. This was an arranged marriage to his uncle's daughter. It soon resulted in children. A son named Uday was born in 1964 followed by another boy named Kusay in 1966, and then three daughters, Rahad, Rana, and Hala, born in 1968, 1969, and 1972, respectively. These were not Saddam's only children. Eventually, in 1986, he married for a second time to Samira Shabandar. He is also believed to have had a third and fourth wife though these remain unconfirmed. Through these liaisons, Saddam probably had several other children, yet his first marriage and the children which resulted from it were the most significant. He was, despite the brutality of his political career, said to have been a devoted father, the first of many contradictions in an individual who was at once somebody who used chemical weapons as conventional weapons of war and engaged in genocide against sections of the Iraqi people, but at the same time was known on occasions for his philanthropy and charity. The ascent of Saddam Hussein to political power in Iraq might best be said to have begun in 1968 with the 17th of July revolution, which saw the Ba'athists finally seize complete control of the Iraqi state. Widespread instability had been created across the Middle East by the Six-Day War between Israel and Egypt, the former allied with several other Arab states, including Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. 
This, combined with the drift of the Republican government in Baghdad towards closer ties with the United States, led many, including the Ba'athists, to believe that a radical change of the political system in Iraq was needed. Accordingly, on the 17th of July 1968, elements within the Ba'athist movement and the Iraqi military led what was effectively a bloodless coup and seized control of the government in Baghdad. The country's growing ties to the U.S. were denounced, and a Ba'athist government was then established, one which was led by Ahmad Hassan al bakha Ahmed was Saddam's cousin, and Hussein was quickly appointed as vice president of the Republic of Iraq, in part for his role in purging the Ba'athist movement of leading figures who were opposed to Ahmed's government program in the late 1960s. It was the beginning of his ascent to become ruler of Iraq. Over the next 10 years, Saddam made himself indispensable in the governance of Iraq under the Ba'athist regime. He was an effective administrator, one who oversaw wide-ranging reforms of the Iraqi economy and began transforming the country into one of the richest nations in the Middle East. Much of this was based on Iraq's oil reserves, the country having some of the largest proven oil fields in the world, ones which continue to make the Iraqi economy overwhelmingly reliant on oil half a century later. Yet when the Ba'athists came to power in 1968, the country's oil industry was still controlled to a great extent by Western interests in the shape of British and American oil companies. Saddam set about aggressively nationalizing the companies in the early 1970s, measures which were aided by the advent of the 1973 energy crisis, as the Middle East's largest oil sellers limited supplies to Western states, such as the US and Britain, which had offered support to Israel during the Yom Kippur War, a conflict between Israel and several of its Arab neighbors, notably Egypt and Syria. Oil prices skyrocketed by nearly 300% from roughly $3 a barrel to $12. Due to these outside conflicts, and because of Saddam nationalizing the Iraqi oil industry at just the right time, the Iraqi exchequer benefited exponentially from oil profits. With the oil revenue, which began streaming into Iraq in the early to mid-1970s, the Ba'athists were in a position to begin modernizing the country and implementing an ambitious set of social policies, which for a time made Iraq the nation with the best standard of living amongst the Muslim nations of the Middle East. Saddam was responsible for overseeing much of this. For instance, he spearheaded an education campaign, which led to a very significant increase in literacy levels amongst both men and women in the country. He was also in charge of the establishment of a system of universal basic health care. These efforts earned him formal recognition for his actions from UNESCO. Moreover, Saddam attempted to put the Iraq economy on a more secure long-term footing by using the oil profits made in the 1970s to develop new businesses and a modern infrastructure across the country the goal being to diversify so that when oil profits declined at some future date, the country would be ready and able to flourish based on its new industries. To this end, the country's agriculture sector was also developed by Hussein, with an emphasis on introducing mechanization to agricultural practices to replace antiquated plows and primitive pre-industrial farming methods. The 1970s were also a period of realignment in terms of Iraq's foreign policy. As a socialist Ba'athist, Hussein was initially committed to drawing Iraq closer to the Soviet Union and away from the US and other Western powers, a drift which had been necessitated in any event by the nationalization of Western oil companies in Iraq in the early 1970s. Then, in 1972, a 15-year pact on economic and diplomatic cooperation was signed between Iraq and the Soviet Union. In retaliation, the U.S. administration of President Richard Nixon began channeling aid to the Kurds of northern Iraq, who wished to obtain their own country in the region. Eventually, this led, in 1974, to the outbreak of the Second Iraqi-Kurdish War 
a continuation of a long-running conflict which had been ubiquitous in Iraq during the 1960s, but which had abated as peace negotiations were entered into between the Ba'athist government and the Kurds led by Mustafa Barzani in the early 1970s. Saddam, though, managed to counteract this threat by negotiating the Algiers Accords in 1975 between Iran and Iraq, an agreement mediated by Houari Boumedien, the leader of Algeria. Through this, Iran agreed to stop providing military and logistical assistance to the Kurds of Iraq in return for a small territorial concession to Iran along the Shat al-Arab River. With this, the Kurdish military unrest was quickly suppressed and northern Iraq was taken firmly back under the control of the government in Baghdad, though it would not be the last significant intervention Hussein made in the Kurdish region. The second half of the 1970s saw Saddam move to a position of unprecedented strength in Iraq. Already in the early and mid-1970s, he had emerged as the second-in-command of the Ba'athist regime junior only to his cousin, President al-Bakr. During this period, he had a deep involvement in managing the Iraqi economy, elements of foreign policy, and a wide range of other matters. Then in 1976, Saddam was also promoted to the rank of general within the Iraqi army. Al-Bakr, by this time, was beginning to suspect Saddam was moving to secure absolute power in Iraq. And so he entered in the late 1970s into negotiations with the Ba'athist regime in neighboring Syria, whereby the two countries would enter into a political union, one in which al-Bakr would act as the senior ruler until his death or retirement, to be succeeded thereafter by President Hafez al-Assad of Syria. This arrangement would have effectively excluded Saddam from succeeding as the next ruler of Iraq once al-Bakr was out of the way. This diplomatic chess move led Saddam to act to secure his position, and on the 16th of July 1979, with the support of the military and many of the senior figures within the Ba'athist government, he forced al-Bakr to resign as president of Iraq. Saddam then assumed the role of head of state that same day in a bloodless coup. He would remain in control of Iraq for the next 24 years. One of Saddam's first acts as the new head of state and of the Ba'athist regime in Iraq was to purge the Ba'athist party of his opponents or any potential rivals for power. This occurred just six days after he seized power on the 22nd of July, 1979. In line with his assumption of power, Saddam convened a meeting of the Ba'athist party's most senior and mid-ranking officials to meet at the al khuld Hall in Baghdad. When they arrived at the hall, the party's members were met with an unexpected announcement. Saddam addressed them and claimed that he had discovered a fifth column operating within the Ba'athist party, one which was trying to undermine their control of the Iraqi state and ultimately pave the way for the Ba'athist party of Syria to assume control over Iraq. Muhi Abdul Hussein, the former private secretary to al-Bakr, then came forward to confess that he had been involved in this conspiracy since 1975, and then read out the names of 68 other individuals within the party who were complicit. Whether he had been tortured or his family threatened in order to ensure this confession remains unclear. What is known is that Abdul Hussein and the 68 co-conspirators were led away to be detained. A special criminal court was then convened at which show trials were held over the next two weeks. Ultimately, 21 individuals were eventually executed, while others were removed from their positions as Saddam rid himself of any and all opposition. The purge of the summer of 1979 also saw a collapse in diplomatic relations between the Ba'athists of Iraq and those in Syria. The purge of the Ba'ath Party and the manner in which Saddam seized power in the summer of 1979 set the tone for his period as ruler of Iraq, where in the 1970s Hussein had been an effective politician who introduced many beneficial reforms to Iraqi society 
and raised the standards of living for a great many Iraqi citizens, after becoming dictator of the country in 1979, Hussein became a more megalomaniacal authoritarian tyrant. Through paramilitary organizations, such as the Iraqi Popular Army, and secret police bodies, such as the Mukhabarat, or Iraqi Intelligence Service, Saddam initiated a reign of terror in the early 1980s, which continued for over two decades, with widespread monitoring of society for political dissidents, active persecution of groups such as the Kurds and radical Shia Muslims, and the illegal arrest, detention, and torture of tens of thousands of Iraqis for suspected opposition to the regime and dissident activity. This even extended beyond the borders of Iraq, and during the 1980s, the Mukhabarat was responsible for the overseas execution of Iraqi political exiles in countries as disparate as Sweden and Sudan. Saddam oversaw all of this, thus cementing his role in history as a tyrant. Hand in hand with this growing tyranny was the development of a cult of leadership in the 1980s. Saddam liked to depict himself as a successor to the fabled great king of ancient Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and went so far as to have archaeological sites around Iraq dating back thousands of years stamped with his name. Elsewhere, statues were erected to Hussein throughout Iraq, and his image began to appear everywhere in Iraqi society, from coins and banknotes to murals on the sides of buildings in Baghdad and the other major cities and towns of the nation. Two staged national elections were also held over the years, the first in 1995 and the second in 2002, during which Hussein allegedly received nearly 100% of the vote in a ludicrous showpiece, which was the staple of many 20th century dictators. It is easy to scoff at such displays of dictatorial power and see them as being over the top and ineffective, but these worked very successfully for many dictators during the 20th century, effectively convincing people that there was only one plausible leader of their country such was his prevalence in all aspects of public life. This, combined with the brutal actions of the secret police and other state services, ensured that Saddam had an iron grip on power in Iraq from 1979 onwards, even as the economy of the country began to deteriorate sharply owing to declining oil revenues and a protracted war with Iran. Much of the first half of Saddam's reign over Iraq was dominated and shaped by conflict with Iraq's eastern neighbor, Iran. In 1979, the Iranian Revolution had driven the Western-supported tyrannical Shah of Iran from power and brought Ruhollah Khomeini and his Islamist followers to power in Iran. This was now a theocracy or religious state, one dominated by Shia Muslims. The majority of Iraq's Muslims were also Shias, whereas Saddam and the Ba'ath Party were generally comprised of Sunni Muslims, the two denominations of Muslims which had emerged over a thousand years earlier following a dispute over who should head the Arab Muslim Caliphate. The concern for the Ba'athists in Iraq following the Iranian Revolution was that Khomeini and his followers would attempt to begin undermining their Western neighbor by appealing to the Shia majority within Iraq and spreading Islamist ideology into the country at a time when the Ba'athists were aiming for a more secular regime. Hostilities escalated as soon as the revolution occurred, driven to a large extent by Saddam, who was confident of Western aid from countries like the United States, who wished to see the Iranian revolution crushed or substantially reversed. Consequently, in September 1980, he initiated hostilities the Iran-Iraq war would last for the next eight years in one of the bloodiest conflicts ever seen in the modern Middle East. The war which followed was broadly a border conflict, with the Iraqis launching an invasion of Western Iran in late 1980, one which faltered in 1981 and resulted in a subsequent Iranian counteroffensive. By 1982, Saddam was making it clear that he would consider a ceasefire and peace negotiations, 
as the quick victory he had expected had instead turned into a war of attrition. However, by that time, Iran's military buildup and tactical advances were such that it had obtained the upper hand, and instead of seeking peace terms, the revolutionary government took the war onto Iraqi soil, nearly taking the region around the city of Basra in Iraq in the mid-1980s. However, the tactical situation changed again after this, as Saddam's government expanded the military draft and as he received increased amounts of aid from foreign powers. By 1985, the Iraqis were able to launch a fresh offensive, but as in 1980 and 1981, it stalled and was followed by another Iranian counteroffensive, one which saw the Iranians capture Al Ghor in southern Iraq in 1986 in a move which shocked the Iraqi military command. Yet the government in Tehran could not follow this up with subsequent advances, and the war once again entered a period of stalemate. The Iran-Iraq War has been much commented upon over the years for two particular aspects. One was the support which Saddam and the Ba'athists in Iraq received from Western governments such as the United States. There is no denying that this was the case, and there was no effort made to disguise it with regular debates in the US Congress throughout the 1980s about the level of aid being supplied to Hussein. This took the shape of financing and war materiel, and was perhaps crucial in stopping an Iranian victory at certain points in the war around 1982 and 1983. However, it must be acknowledged that this did not mean that the US viewed Saddam and Iraq as allies in the 1980s. It was more the case that they perceived Iran as the greater of the two evils, and were willing to supply Iraq with support to avoid an Iranian conquest of Iraq. The second major element of the conflict, which has become notorious, was the use of chemical weapons by Iraq in the shape of mustard gas and sarin, particularly in situations when it was existentially threatened by Iranian advances. On the other side, the Iranian widespread use of child soldiers led to the deaths of tens of thousands of teenagers on the field of battle during the war. Eventually, the war came to an end. Although throughout much of the conflict Iran had had the upper hand, and indeed had obtained it again in 1986 and 1987, war weariness was setting in at home, and Iran's resources and sheer manpower were becoming depleted within the army. It also seemed unlikely that a killer blow could be struck against Iraq. It was in this context that Saddam sent a warning to Tehran that he would commence a new bombing campaign and widespread use of chemical weapons in 1988 if Iran did not enter talks. Tehran understood that with Western states seemingly unwilling to temper Saddam's worst instincts, negotiations would have to be entered into. This was compounded by the US's shooting down of an Iranian civilian airliner in July 1988, a measure which worried the Ayatollah and others in Iran that more direct US involvement might be imminent. With this in mind, peace terms were agreed to, and the war came to an end in August 1988. It had lasted nearly eight years, had resulted in roughly one million deaths, though the figures are contested, and had achieved absolutely nothing for either side. Both sides claimed victory, but in reality, the war had been brought to an end in a stalemate. The end of the Iraq-Iran war did not result in peace settling over Iraq for any sustained period of time. Indeed, Saddam determined to use the closing stages of the war as a smokescreen for what amounted to a campaign of genocide against the Kurdish minority in northern Iraq. The Kurdish people are one of the most unfortunate groups in modern history. They number in the millions and dominate a large stretch of territory in the north of the Middle East, around northern Iraq, southeastern Turkey and adjoining regions. They have never had their own country in the modern era, despite their efforts following the First World War, but because of their desire for self-determination, they have regularly been persecuted by governments in Iraq and Turkey. 
In the course of the Iran-Iraq war, many Kurds and Kurdish political organizations had sided with Iran and had engaged in an insurgency war against the Iraqi government. Now, early in 1988, as the conflict with Iran drew to a conclusion, Saddam ordered divisions of Iraqi troops into northern Iraq to launch a counter-insurgency campaign against the Kurds. The Al-Anfal campaign, as it is known, a term which translates as the spoils of war, lasted from February 1988 through to the late autumn of that year. In the course of it, between 50,000 and 100,000 Kurds were killed, while tens of thousands more were displaced or forcibly deported from their places of residence. Detention camps were also set up, and a forced program of Arabization was initiated. There is little doubt that Saddam effectively implemented a program of genocide against the Kurds in 1988. Saddam was soon to engender the opposition of his reluctant allies from the Iran-Iraq war, the United States, and the other Western powers. In the course of the war with Iran, Hussein's government had borrowed billions of dollars from its near neighbor, the small but oil-rich Gulf state of Kuwait. It was possibly owing to Iraq's complete inability to repay this money that Saddam determined, not long after the war with Iran ended, to invade Kuwait. There were other extenuating circumstances. Kuwait had ruffled many feathers within OPEC, the cartel of the world's major oil exporting nations, which is heavily centered on the Middle East. By refusing to lower production and the amount of barrels it was exporting, Kuwait was driving down world oil prices and impacting the profits of countries like Iraq. Finally, the Iraqis also claimed that Kuwait had been slant drilling into Iraqi fields illegally. For these multiple reasons, Iraq invaded Kuwait on the 2nd of August, 1990. The ensuing conflict cannot be called a war. Kuwait had no major military to speak of and was confronted by a country whose military had swelled to become the fourth largest army in the world during the 1980s. By the 3rd of August, just a day into the invasion, most of Kuwait was under the control of Saddam's military. Just 24 hours later, the country was entirely in Iraqi possession, and Saddam declared Kuwait to now be the 19th province of Iraq, at once freeing Iraq from its debt to Kuwait and bringing it a new oil-rich region. Saddam seems to have decided to invade Kuwait based on the mistaken belief that his allies in the West would not react, as they still viewed him as a bulwark against Iran in the Middle East. He was entirely wrong in this assessment. Within days, the United States and its allies, who by the summer of 1990 were effectively in charge of the world order as the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War came to an end, were placing economic and diplomatic sanctions on Iraq. A naval blockade of the Persian Gulf followed which crippled Iraq's ability to export the oil on which Saddam depended to run the country and support its huge military machine. Diplomatic tensions were ratcheted up by the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who convinced the US President George Bush to take a strong stance against Saddam. For his part, Saddam claimed that he would be willing to consider withdrawing from Kuwait if other territorial issues in the Middle East such as the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory, were resolved in tandem, a dispensation which he knew would not be acceptable to Washington. He further inflamed tensions in mid to late August by refusing to allow Westerners who were in Iraq to leave the country, and even appearing on television broadcasts with what were effectively British prisoners. All of this was sufficient for the US, Britain, and others to begin formulating plans for a counter-invasion of Kuwait in response to Iraqi aggression. Saudi Arabia, an oil-rich kingdom and rival to the south, would be used as a staging ground for the campaign. The first Gulf War got underway after months of planning in January 1991. An aerial bombing campaign was undertaken on the 16th of January and a land invasion followed. As American and British troops streamed into Kuwait in early February, Saddam ordered the country's oil fields to be set alight. 
In total, out of some 730 oil wells located across Kuwait, approximately 600 were satellite in January and February 1991. Although the environmental damage was less than had been predicted by some scientists, the resulting plumes of smoke still absorbed upwards of 80% of the sun's radiation throughout 1991 in the Middle East, with some regions being pitch black at noon and temperatures falling by an average of 5 degrees Celsius. It would take until the autumn to extinguish all of the fires. By then, Saddam's armies had been easily vanquished from Kuwait, with Operation Desert Storm finishing on the 28th of February, 1991. The US and its allies took the decision to stop once the Iraqis had been driven out of Kuwait. President Bush had no desire to extend the war into Iraqi territory, or to try to depose Saddam as leader of Iraq. That particular task would be undertaken by his son, over a decade later. While Saddam had managed to survive his spectacularly ill-judged decision to invade Kuwait and remained in power through the 1990s, the end of the Gulf War saw Iraq hit with a wide range of sanctions by the international community. Many of these were imposed immediately following the invasion of Kuwait and were never lifted. Others were intended to cripple any efforts by the country to continue producing chemical weapons or to further its nuclear weapons program, which it had initiated many years earlier. The most crippling element of this was the US-led embargo on Iraqi oil. Iraq's economy, and with it much of Saddam's power, was based on the export of oil, as Iraq, then as now, has some of the world's largest proven oil fields and reserves. Although an oil for food program was agreed upon in 1996 in order to aid the deteriorating Iraqi economy, the country was still very limited in what it could or could not import and export for the remainder of Saddam's tenure as the country's dictator. Much of this negatively impacted the Iraqi population, and by the end of the 20th century, metrics like average salaries and child mortality in Iraq were falling below where they had been half a century earlier, when the region was still a monarchical state influenced by Britain. While the Iraqi economy was in a shambles in the 1990s after the Gulf War, Saddam was never more entrenched in power than he was from 1991 onwards. The US had effectively signaled its unwillingness to remove him from power by not pressing on from Kuwait into Iraq itself in the spring of 1991. Moreover, Saddam also did not face a threat from any of Iraq's immediate neighbors for the first time in over a decade. The chastening experience of invading Kuwait had also reconciled him to the fact that Iraq could not attempt to wage any further wars on its neighbors. Instead, he concentrated in the years following the Gulf War on using the state apparatus in Iraq to galvanize the population in support of his regime against what were portrayed as the aggressive Westerners who had declared war on Iraq in 1990. There was also a notable drift towards a more religious dictatorship. The Ba'ath Party had been founded on the principle of establishing a more secular Middle East, and Saddam had been largely a-religious in his policies throughout the late 1970s and 1980s but the 1990s witnessed efforts to utilize Islam to enforce a greater form of despotism across Iraq at a time when religious extremism across the Middle East was increasing markedly. As the Iraqi economy deteriorated in the 1990s and Iraq turned into a shell of the country which it had aspired to be in the 1960s and 1970s, the Hussein family dictatorship became even more entrenched. This was most clearly seen in the actions of Saddam's two sons from his first marriage, Uday and Kusay. Kusay was the younger of the pair, though after a certain point, it seems clear that he was Saddam's probable successor had the dictatorship survived long enough. He was also the head of the Republican Guard. In the early 1990s, directly after the Gulf War, he was responsible for crushing a Shiite Muslim rising in the marshlands of southern Iraq and thereafter initiated a demographic and ecological disaster in the region by flooding these marshlands to destroy the traditional way of life of the Shiite Arabs who had lived there for many centuries. 
Yet as problematic as Kusei's behavior was, it paled by comparison with that of his older brother Uday. Uday was a notorious alcoholic, rapist, murderer, and psychopath. One who held parties in Baghdad where he would encourage the other guests to get extremely drunk before engaging in all manner of sadistic acts. Amongst some of the more bizarre activities in his reign of terror are reports that he frequently tortured members of the Iraqi football team if they lost matches. By the mid-1990s, his behavior had become so erratic, often showing up to parties in Baghdad wielding and using firearms, that close family members felt threatened enough to defect to nearby Jordan for fear of their lives. There were also many, many allegations that Uday regularly tortured his own employees by having their feet whipped by his bodyguards, while he became known as a serial rapist during the 1990s, often prowling the streets of Baghdad in his collection of sports cars, looking for women that he wanted brought to one of his palaces. A failed assassination attempt left him partially disabled in one leg in late 1996, a development which did nothing to temper his most excessive behavior. There is evidence that Saddam was fully aware of his eldest son's egregious actions as late as the late 1980s, but he did very little to regulate his conduct. As a result, Uday visited horrors on the people of Baghdad in the 1990s and early 2000s. Perhaps one of the least well-known but most curious points concerning Saddam was his written output in the early 2000s. In these years, Hussein wrote four novels and several poems, often with the aid of ghostwriters, which were either published in Iraq before his fall from power, or else later with the encouragement of his daughters from his first marriage. The first of these was Sabida and the King, the story of a medieval woman named Zabida who becomes involved with the king of Iraq during the early stages of Arab and Muslim rule here in the 7th and 8th centuries. The novel is based around Tikrit, Saddam's home region, and generally is seen as an allegory of the alleged destruction of Iraq by the US-led sanctions against the country in the aftermath of the First Gulf War. Although the author of this was given only as written by he who wrote it, it is generally agreed that this was Hussein's work. Further books followed in 2001 and 2002, notably Men and the City, an account of the Hussein family's role in overthrowing Ottoman rule in Iraq during the early 20th century and the subsequent rise of the Ba'ath party in the region. It is generally agreed that this was written almost entirely by Saddam, as a manuscript in his own idiosyncratic handwriting was located after the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. Saddam's imaginings of the US as being the power which had undermined Iraq and its potential were not far off the mark. There can be little doubt that Western sanctions against Iraq in the 1990s and into the early 2000s led to declining living standards in Iraq as people were unable to acquire some goods entirely or found them to be incredibly expensive owing to the restrictions imposed on the Iraq import economy. But there is also little doubt that Saddam and his corrupt family regime also brought this upon Iraq through their failure to be transparent about their efforts to develop weapons of mass destruction. The degree to which economic and political sanctions were to be imposed on Iraq after the first Gulf War was always tied to whether Saddam and his regime would divest the country of all such weapons. Admittedly, in 1991, Hussein's government effectively gave up all of its chemical weapons, but there were lingering efforts throughout the 1990s to produce new weapons of mass destruction, notably biological and chemical weapons, such as mustard gas, sarin gas, and anthrax. UN inspectors in the mid-1990s discovered that chemicals and compounds like this had been produced in Iraq in the years after the Gulf War and most likely tested on prisoners from Abu Ghraib prison near Baghdad. Yet subsequent UN inspections were clear that Saddam's regime had no major effective way of deploying weapons of mass destruction of any kind against foreign nations. What would perhaps tip the balance against Saddam in this respect, though, 
was that following a new UN inspection in 1998, the regime simply became uncooperative with the UN inspectors. Ultimately, whether or not Saddam continued to have any designs on developing a nuclear program or chemical and biological weapons in the 1990s and early 2000s would become a major issue which would lead to the end of his regime and his life in the mid-2000s. On the 11th of September 2001, the Islamic terrorist organization Al-Qaeda, led by Osama bin Laden, launched a series of attacks on the United States, most notably by hijacking two commercial airliners on the east coast of America and flying them into the Twin Towers in downtown Manhattan in New York. In response, the administration of President George W. Bush, the son of the President Bush who had overseen the expulsion of Saddam's armies from Kuwait a decade earlier, launched the War on Terror a campaign to overthrow regimes in the Middle East and Islamic world which had supported Al-Qaeda. This began quite reasonably with an invasion of Afghanistan, where bin Laden was being protected at that time. No sooner had Afghanistan been occupied than Bush's senior officials turned their attentions towards Iraq. While there was zero evidence to suggest that bin Laden had been in any way supported by Saddam, U.S. justification for intervention in Iraq would focus on the illusory notion that Saddam was close to acquiring a nuclear weapon. The evidence was insubstantial and would later be proved to be non-existent, a factor which divided the Western world in its support or opposition to the proposed invasion of Iraq. But in the end, the Bush administration, supported by Prime Minister Tony Blair in Britain, pressed ahead with its agenda and began preparing to invade Iraq in the spring of 2003. Saddam's time as the country's leader was drawing to a close after a quarter of a century. The US invasion of Iraq, or Second Gulf War as it is sometimes referred to, was initially a very successful military intervention against Hussein's regime. The conventional war lasted a period of just a few weeks in the spring of 2003. This saw a joint US-British force invade Iraq from the south, along with small contingents of Allied troops from varying allies of the US, though significantly traditional allies of Washington and London, such as the French and Germans, condemned the invasion as a war of adventure and refused to take part in it. A bombing campaign commenced in mid-March 2003, codenamed Shock and Awe, before the coalition forces, consisting of upwards of half a million men, plus the Peshmerga Kurds and other disaffected groups within Iraq itself, which allied with the US as part of the campaign, moved into southern Iraq. What followed over the next three weeks can scarcely be called a war. The Iraqi armed forces though nominally quite strong and numerous, utterly collapsed when confronted by the forces of the world's foremost military power. After the initial incursion, US and Allied troops quickly made for Baghdad, seizing and occupying the Iraqi capital on the 9th of April. By that time, Saddam and his family and Iraqi government had fled from Baghdad. Final defenses were mounted around the Tikrit region, Saddam's homeland, before that too fell to the US and their allies in mid-April. On the 1st of May, just six weeks after the initiation of the campaign, President George W. Bush visited Iraq and declared an end to the major combat and victory in the campaign. This, though, was wildly premature, and while the Ba'athists might have been defeated in the spring of 2003, the ensuing military occupation of Iraq by the US and British stirred up such an array of political and religious discontents that there would be no peace in Iraq thereafter. As the Allied forces headed for Baghdad, Saddam, his family, and many leading members of the Ba'athist regime fled from the capital and went into hiding. This even led the US Army to issue Marines in Iraq with decks of playing cards which had images of the 52 most wanted Iraqis. In this, Saddam was the ace of spades, while his sons Uday and Kuzey featured as the ace of clubs and ace of hearts. 
the latter two individuals would soon be found. Uday and Kuze were tracked down by American soldiers on the 9th of April 2003 and killed in a military standoff in the city of Mosul, having tried to make it over the border to Syria. Saddam was probably already in the Tikrit region by then, where despite one of the largest manhunts in history, he managed to remain in hiding for over half a year. He was not finally captured until Operation Red Dawn resulted in his capture on the 13th of December 2003, after an acquaintance of Hussein's had divulged his location. It was a humbling last hiding place for the former dictator, with him pulled in a disheveled state from what was little more than a hole in the ground by American troops that day. Four days prior to Saddam's capture, the US occupation government had already created the Iraqi Special Tribunal to prosecute leading members of the Iraqi regime and the Iraqi military who were deemed to have committed crimes against humanity or been involved in the attempted genocide of Iraq's Kurds. Hussein would now be tried before this tribunal. As he awaited trial, he was transferred to Camp Cropper in Baghdad and held there with nearly a dozen other senior Ba'athists. They would remain there for over a year and a half before Saddam's trial finally commenced on the 19th of October 2005. When it finally commenced after this long delay, Saddam refused to recognize the legitimacy of the court, claiming that he could not be tried by what he viewed to be a kangaroo court controlled by foreign invaders of Iraq. Over the next several months, he refused to cooperate with the proceedings, alleging that he had been tortured by his captors and the fact that one of his lawyers was killed during the trial. As a result, Saddam went on a hunger strike for a time in 2006, but none of his objections met with any success. The trial proceeded without his cooperation, and on the 6th of November 2006, more than a year after the trial commenced, Saddam was found guilty of having committed crimes against humanity, amongst other misdeeds, during his long time as dictator of Iraq. He was sentenced to death by hanging. After he was found guilty and sentenced to death, Saddam's legal team entered an appeal. But this was rejected within a few weeks, and an order was issued that the sentence of execution was to be carried out within 30 days. As related since by some of those who were charged with guarding the former dictator, his last days were highly unusual. Those involved were a group of a dozen members of the 551st Military Police Company. Members recounted how Saddam spent his final days eating muffins and listening to Mary J. Blige records, while intermittently regaling his captors with stories about his time as ruler of Iraq. He was also provided with a small garden plot, which he weeded regularly. Some of his old traits as dictator were still evident. When he requested an omelette for breakfast, he insisted on sending it back if the outside was torn in any fashion while removing it from the pan. Other than this, he spent much time on an exercise bike, which he insisted on calling his pony. It was a peculiar last chapter to his life. On the 30th of December 2006, the sentence of execution was carried out when Saddam was hanged at Camp Justice in Baghdad, which led certain sections of the Iraqi populace to celebrate. The dictator's final meal was of chicken and rice with some hot water and honey. His request to be executed by firing squad was rejected. His body was subsequently sent back to his home region and buried in a family plot at Tikrit. Despite the best hopes of many within the US administration that the execution of Saddam and the full dismantling of the Ba'athist regime would bring about a transformation of the country into a fully functioning democracy, no such metamorphosis was to occur. Indeed, even during the months of Saddam's imprisonment and trial, Iraq had been descending into anarchy. A caretaker government was established in June 2004, and the country's first legitimate parliamentary elections were held in January 2005. But even as these were being held, civil war was breaking out across the country, 
as religious radicals like the cleric Muqtada al-Sadr effectively established their own militias throughout the country and even within Baghdad itself. Attacks on U.S. military personnel were rampant and the administration was reliant on creating a green zone within Baghdad, a heavily fortified and defended district which became the only major part of the country where U.S. personnel were fully free from fear of attack. By 2006, when Saddam was killed, U.S. Army personnel were reporting that they had effectively lost control over parts of the country. A troop surge the following year led to a revitalization of the American position, but ultimately, Iraq was never transformed in the way which had been envisaged in 2003. As the U.S. gradually pulled out of the country from 2011, it became a hotbed of insurrections and instability, most notably as the Islamic State secured control over large parts of the North in the mid-2010s, whilst fresh political unrest has characterized the early 2020s. Thus, while Saddam has been gone a long time, the political chaos which he and the Ba'ath is sowed there remains. Saddam Hussein was unquestionably one of the most brutal dictators of the 20th century. He rose on the back of the Ba'athist movement in the 1960s and 1970s, a political movement which for all its sins at least originally had some ideological basis to it in its pan-Arab and socialist outlook. Saddam, by way of contrast, had no ideological grounding other than the attainment of power. In the course of the 1970s, he began monopolizing it, and from the late 1970s onwards, he was the de facto dictator of Iraq. His tenure of that position was disastrous for the Iraqi people and for the people of several neighboring countries. He plunged Iraq and Iran into one of the bloodiest conflicts of the post-Second World War period, one which lasted for much of the 1980s killed hundreds of thousands of people and ordered the widespread use of chemical weapons. Then he engaged in genocide against the Kurds of Iraq before invading Kuwait. All of these actions led to an immense series of international sanctions against Iraq in the 1990s, which undermined the quality of life of the average Iraqi even further. The last 10 years of his tenure were characterized by a growing despotism personified in the brutal behavior of his sons and other members of the regime. While many people questioned what the motives of the Bush administration really were in invading Iraq in 2003, and whether it was a war of adventure to secure control of the country's vast oil reserves, a claim many scholars dispute, there can be no doubt that it did achieve the successful end of a brutal tyrant and regime. What do you think of Saddam Hussein? Was he truly one of the 20th century's most brutal dictators amongst the ranks of Mao Zedong, Joseph Stalin, and Adolf Hitler? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Osama bin Laden was born on the 10th of March 1957. His birthplace is a matter of dispute, with international police organizations believing for years that he was born in the city of Jeddah in Western Arabia, but it is now generally accepted that he was born in the Saudi capital Riyadh. His father was Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden, who was born in Yemen in 1908. When he was a child, his family had emigrated from Yemen, north to the red coast of Western Arabia, in a region which now forms part of Saudi Arabia, but which was, at the time, disputed between the Ottoman Empire and the Royal House of Saud. In the 1930s, he had emerged as a successful construction contractor, working for the first ruler of Saudi Arabia, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. Under the patronage of the royal family, the company he founded, the Saudi Bin Laden Group, emerged as an enormously successful and wealthy construction company in the fledgling nation, even as it became the world's largest oil exporter and an extremely wealthy nation for successful families such as the Bin Ladens. Osama's mother was Hamida al-Attas, a native Syrian 
who came from a family of successful citrus farmers operating around the port city of Latakia. She became Mohammed's tenth wife in 1956 when she married the 48-year-old millionaire when she was just 14 years of age. A year later, Osama was born. He was their only child and Mohammed and Hamida separated soon afterwards. This has caused speculation that they never actually married and Hamida was just briefly Mohammed's concubine. Osama's youth and upbringing was one of privilege. By the time he was born, his father was a multimillionaire, though his wealth would have stretched into the billions if adjusted for inflation today. Shortly after his parents' divorce, Osama's mother remarried to a business associate of Mohammed bin Laden's, Mohammed al Atas. They had four children together in the 1960s, three boys and one girl. Osama was sent to live with them, and so he grew up in his mother's and stepfather's household with several step siblings. But it would be wrong to suggest that he was estranged from his father. Mohammed bin Laden played a major role in his son's development, instilling in him much of his conservative religious fervor. Beginning in 1968, Osama attended the Al Taga Model School, a secondary school in Jeddah. In 1971, he gained direct experience of the Western world when he was sent to Oxford University in Britain to undertake an English language course. Beyond this, he is believed to have displayed some traits typical of young boys during his childhood and early teenage years, being a football fan who followed Arsenal Football Club and showed an interest in military history. For all that, Osama's younger years had an air of normality to it, whereas there is no doubting that his background was anything but normal. By the 1960s, the Saudi Bin Laden Group was one of the most significant corporations in the entire Arab world. Its ties to the Saudi royal family were extremely extensive, and the company had even been granted the contracts to manage the ongoing repairs of the mosques in the two most holy cities in the Islamic world, Mecca and Medina. In 1964, the company acquired the contract to reclad the exterior of the Dome of the Rock, the most important Muslim religious site in Jerusalem. By that time, the ties between Mohammed bin Laden and the Saudi royal family had become extremely extensive. However, in 1967, Mohammed was killed at 59 years of age in an airplane accident in Saudi Arabia when the pilot misjudged the plane's landing. Despite this setback, the Saudi bin Laden group continued to prosper under the leadership of several of Muhammad's sons from his earlier marriages and indeed, as it diversified in the 1970s and 1980s, it became a multi-billion dollar company with lucrative contracts all over the Middle East. Osama was not involved in the Saudi bin Laden group's business activities in the years after his father's death for the simple reason that he was too young. Instead, he was continuing his education. When he was 19 years of age, in 1976, Osama entered the King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah, where he began studying economics and business administration, no doubt with a view to taking up some sort of position within the family business in years to come. Already, however, he had begun to stray from an interest in business, with reports by people who knew bin Laden there stating that his primary interests were in religion, poetry, and Arab literature. He certainly didn't need to worry about money, his education, and future work, as Osama stood to inherit upwards of $30 million from his father's estate. He was also married by this time, having wed his first wife, a Syrian woman named Najwa Hanim, in 1974 when he was just 17 years old. She was also his first cousin on his mother's side and the first of at least five wives. Osama would father over two dozen children during his life. Clearly, the mid to late 1970s were a formative period in Osama's life and his ideological views, though much of the evidence concerning these years is frustratingly patchy and sometimes contradictory. Nevertheless, the broad thrust of his views is clear. Osama began to develop a pan-Islamist ideology from early on in his life, a movement which espouses the idea that Muslims in all nations should be unified in defense and promotion of their faith. This view harks back to the age of the Arab Caliphate, which, between the 8th and 11th centuries, ruled most of the Middle East, North Africa, 
and adjoining regions from the caliphate's capital of Baghdad. Central to pan-Islamism in the 1960s and 1970s was a commitment to reducing and, if possible, ending Western involvement in the Middle East, a region which had been dominated by the British and French since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War and wherein the United States was becoming an increasingly interested party even as British and French influence declined. The Middle Eastern world, which Osama grew up in, was also one in which the new state of Israel, backed strongly by the United States, was frequently at war with its Muslim neighbors, notably the Six-Day War of 1967 and the War of Yom Kippur in 1973. A particularly strong influence on Osama in the 1970s were the writings of Saeed Qutba, an Egyptian Islamic scholar and religious and political theorist who had been a member of the Muslim Brotherhood until his arrest and execution in 1966. Qutba's extensive writings were widely taught in schools and universities across the Muslim world from the 1940s onwards and included arguments that Islamic Jihad, or struggle against evil, was entirely justifiable in the interests of a new Islamic caliphate and that Sharia law, the law based on a rigid interpretation of the Quran, should be imposed across all Muslim states. A strain of virulent anti-Western sentiment also ran through much of Qutbah's writings, with him denouncing the United States as materialistic, godless, and lacking in spiritual values of any kind. If there was one defining influence on bin Laden's ideological beliefs in the 1960s and 1970s, it was Qutbah. Significantly, Qutbah's brother Muhammad, who became a passionate promoter of his brother's ideas, was a teacher at Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, while Osama was a student there in the late 1970s. Osama finished his studies at Abdulaziz in 1979. It is unclear if he finished with a degree or not. The timing was significant as the Islamic world was in turmoil at this moment. Firstly, the Iranian Revolution of 1978 had seen the Western-backed Shah removed from power in Iran and the creation of a new Islamic state headed by the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. While this was occurring in Iran, to the northeast in Afghanistan, the country was descending into political chaos. In 1978, the Marxist People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, or PDPA, had seized power and begun to establish a socialist, non-religious state. The PDPA had long-standing ties with the Soviet Union, and indeed Russia had always had an interest in Afghanistan, dating back to the mid-19th century, when the country had been an important buffer state between Russia and the British presence in India and Pakistan. Yet there is no major evidence that the Soviets were the driving force behind the PDPA's seizure of power in Afghanistan in 1978. However, they did forge close ties with the new Marxist regime in Kabul once it was in control of the country. Thus, once Islamist groups and other opponents of the PDPA began revolts against the new government in the course of 1978 and 1979, the Marxist regime soon called on Moscow for help. Limited support was sent at first, but as the situation for the PDPA continued to deteriorate, the Soviet Union effectively invaded Afghanistan in the final days of December 1979. By early 1980, thousands of Soviet tanks and tens of thousands of soldiers had been deployed as Moscow occupied the main cities of the country. Even before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Bin Laden had travelled to Pakistan very quickly after finishing his studies at King Abdulaziz University. Pakistan played and continues to play a significant role in international jihadist movements of the 20th and early 21st century. Ostensibly, the country has claimed to be opposed to Islamic fundamentalism operating on its soil, but for decades it has turned a blind eye to this in actuality, in large part because Muslim Pakistan has been involved in a long-running Cold War with its bitter enemy Hindu India, since the British Raj was split up along religious lines in 1947. Pakistan would play a role in Bin Laden's life over the next three decades. Once he arrived there in 1979, he quickly came under the wing of Abdullah Azam, 
a Palestinian-born jihadist who was an influence on many of the most senior Islamic terrorists of the late 20th century. Azam encouraged bin Laden shortly afterwards to join the tens of thousands of Muslim men who were heading to Afghanistan to fight against the atheistic Soviet invaders. These individuals became known as Mujahideen, a term which translates roughly as one who engages in holy war or jihad. In the early 1980s, bin Laden began using his inherited fortune to recruit and train Mujahideen in Pakistan before they headed into the mountainous regions of Afghanistan, though this financing paled in comparison with the billions of dollars spent by the United States and the Saudi Arabian governments in equipping and training anti-Soviet forces in both Afghanistan and Pakistan, which were used as their proxies to fight the Soviet invasion. Moreover, while statements about the extent to which bin Laden was financed and trained himself by American agents at this time have been exaggerated, there is no doubt that he did have some limited contacts with US special forces in the region in the 1980s. The war which bin Laden became involved in from 1980 onwards developed much like conflicts in Afghanistan have for the last two centuries with 80,000 troops committed by the Soviets by the end of 1980 and far superior weaponry, they were able to occupy and hold the main cities and prop up the Marxist PDPA. But the Mujahideen groups, of which there were more moderate and fundamentalist branches, were largely in control of the regions outside of the city, the Hindu Kush mountains, which dominate much of the country particularly in the east and north, are ideal territory for the waging of guerrilla warfare, and this is exactly the shape the Soviet-Afghan war took on in the 1980s. The fighting became extremely bloody as the Soviets used indiscriminate bombing and destruction of rural villages to try to root out the insurgents. By the mid-1980s, upwards of 4 million people out of Afghanistan's population of 14 million had been displaced, with hundreds of thousands becoming refugees in Pakistan and Iran, while the conflict resulted in at least half a million deaths and perhaps as many as three times this amount. It soon became known as the Soviet equivalent of what the Vietnam War had been for America as the Russians faced an enemy which they could not defeat. Throughout this period, bin Laden was a major figure in the Mujahideen movement in Afghanistan. At first, he had begun supplying goods to the fighters in the country and also facilitating the movement of individuals who wanted to take up arms against the Soviets from his native Saudi Arabia to Pakistan, where they were trained and equipped before they were sent north. Throughout these years, bin Laden moved between Pakistan and the Mujahideen strongholds in the mountains of the Hindu Kush. In 1984, he and his mentor Abdullah Azam established Maktab al-Khidamat, an organization which aimed to raise funds from both within the Arab world and the Western world to continue fighting the war against the Soviets. This funding was then used to purchase weapons and train Mujahideen. By 1986, the network had trained hundreds of fighters who were based in eastern Afghanistan at bin Laden's base known as Al-Masada, the Lion's Den. These led the Mujahideen action against the Soviets and the Marxist regime at the Battle of Jaji in the late spring and early summer of 1987. The battle was ultimately of little strategic significance in the wider war, but it gained bin Laden a significant reputation amongst the Mujahideen and within the wider Arab world, in part owing to the reports on the battle produced by an emerging Saudi journalist by the name of Jamal Khashoggi with whom bin Laden was associated but who held very different political religious views to him. The establishment of Maktab al-Khidamat was significant in the 1980s as it laid the groundwork for the jihadist movement with which bin Laden has become synonymous. As the war in Afghanistan headed towards inexorable defeat for the Soviets and the Marxist regime which they propped up in the late 1980s, Thoughts turned to the future of the organization. Some members wanted it to remain a moderate entity which continued the initiative against the Soviets. But bin Laden, Abdullah Azam and others were opposed to this and believed that Maktab al-Khidamat should be transformed into a larger organization 
which would seek to continue the expulsion of non-Arab powers from the Arab and Muslim world. Ultimately, this more extremist wing of the movement resulted in Bin Laden and Azam establishing a new organization in 1988 known as Al-Qaeda, meaning the base or the foundation. In time, it would become the largest jihadist organization in the world and is notorious around the world as such today. Al-Qaeda's goal from its inception was to begin waging holy war or jihad against non-Muslims anywhere in the traditional Muslim world, that is, the Middle East, Lower Central Asia, the Maghreb in North Africa, and also more peripheral parts of the Muslim world such as Somalia, Mali and Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Muslim regions further to the east in Indonesia and elsewhere. Much of its ideological framework centered on removing American influence from the Middle East and also destroying the State of Israel, which it perceived as a Western enclave in the Levant. Over time, the group began to believe it needed to incite a major war against the United States in order to radicalize the Muslim world against the kafir, or non-Muslims. Because the organizations could not hope to engage in outright conflict early on, its modus operandi during its early years would be terrorist tactics. Additionally, Al-Qaeda viewed moderate Muslims as having wavered from traditional Islam and it wished to establish a rigid form of Islamic rule across the Muslim world, one based on Sharia law and a literal interpretation of the Quran. By the time Al-Qaeda was established in 1988, the war in Afghanistan was winding down already. Upon becoming leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev publicly stated that it was his intention to bring Soviet involvement in the country to an end. But much like it took America years to fully extricate itself from Vietnam, the Soviets could not pull out overnight. Indeed, in the short term, there was a significant increase in the number of Soviet troops on the ground in Afghanistan as Moscow attempted to win the war quickly through a troop surge. This did not meet with success as Ronald Reagan's administration continued to send significant amounts of military and financial aid to the Mujahideen. Indeed, once they were equipped with Stinger missiles to shoot down Soviet helicopters, the Mujahideen guerrilla war entered a period of unprecedented success for the insurgents. Eventually, peace accords were signed by the Afghan government, the Soviet Union, the US and Pakistan in 1988 and in 1989 the last Soviet troops were withdrawn. In the years that followed, the Marxist regime began to lose ever greater amounts of ground to the Mujahideen groups and eventually collapsed in 1992. But no sooner was the communist regime out of the way than the various Mujahideen groups turned on each other. Four years of civil war would follow before one group known as the Taliban emerged victorious in 1996, though they would never acquire complete control of the country and indeed much of the north was held into the late 1990s and early 2000s by the Northern Alliance. In the aftermath of the Soviet-Afghan war, Bin Laden initially returned to his native Saudi Arabia in 1989. He received a hero's welcome for his role in having helped to oust the Russians from Afghanistan. Back in the Arabian Peninsula, he began working with the Saudi Bin Laden Group, his father's business, in an effort to leverage its economic might and business ties to help grow Al-Qaeda. In tandem, he began meeting with other leading members of the Islamic Jihadist movement in Egypt and elsewhere. During this time, Relations between Bin Laden and the Saudi government began to deteriorate. Bin Laden was bent on developing an ever more confrontational path against non-Muslims, while the Saudi government continued to foster its position as a key American ally in the Middle East. A point of conflict which arose between Bin Laden and the Saudi regime was over the South Yemen civil war. Bin Laden wished for Saudi Arabia to intervene directly to oust the Soviet-backed Yemeni Socialist Party, but the royal government in Riyadh blocked his efforts to do so. 
Another issue involving another neighbor of Saudi Arabia was soon to cause friction between bin Laden and the Saudi government in ways which would ultimately sever relations between him and the Saudi royal family. On the 2nd of August 1990, Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, who had spent much of the 1980s fighting a war against Iran, in which he was heavily supported by the United States, invaded the small Gulf state of Kuwait, one of the richest nations per capita on earth and one which Iraq owed billions of dollars to, which it had borrowed to finance its war against Iran in the 1980s. The invasion, which saw the small city-state conquered within two days, caused international uproar and, within weeks, the United States was building a coalition of military allies to launch a counter-invasion of Iraq, one which included Britain, France, Germany and dozens of other countries. It was also supported by several Arab and Muslim countries, notably Egypt, Syria and Saudi Arabia. By the autumn of 1990, as negotiations to find a peaceful settlement were still underway, American troops began traveling to the Middle East for a military buildup. They headed primarily for Saudi Arabia, which was to be used as the staging post for the liberation of Kuwait and the attack on Iraq if negotiations failed. That is exactly what happened, and so what was termed Operation Desert Storm by the US military was initiated on the 16th of January 1991. Bin Laden was outraged from the very beginning of the military buildup as the Saudi government agreed to a proposal by the US Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney that America should intervene to prevent any extension of Iraq's aggression into Saudi Arabia. In response to this, Bin Laden organized a meeting with the Saudi ruler King Fahd and requested that the country should prohibit American troops from assembling in Saudi Arabia and that he would use his own Arab Legion formed in Afghanistan during the war to defend the Saudi border against any Iraqi incursion. This offer was spurned and the US and coalition troop buildup intensified in the weeks that followed. As it did, bin Laden began publicly denouncing the Saudi government, engaging in a hostile propaganda campaign in which he stated that the royal family was inviting Western infidels into the kingdom which was the defender of the holiest sites in Islam, Mecca and Medina. He also attempted to convince the ulama, the senior Saudi religious scholars, to issue a fatwa, or religious declaration, condemning the American incursion into the Arabian Peninsula. All of this combined to cause a fatal breach between bin Laden and the Saudi government, and in 1991, they expelled him from the country. Meanwhile, Operation Desert Storm had resulted in the swift defeat of Iraq and the liberation of Kuwait in the spring of 1991. Rather than try to pursue regime change, the US left Saddam Hussein in charge, pulled its troops out of the region and imposed crippling sanctions on Iraq. Following his expulsion from Saudi Arabia in 1991, bin Laden headed for Sudan, settling there in 1992. In 1989, Colonel Omar al-Bashir had seized power in a largely bloodless military coup. He quickly implemented a form of Sharia law across Sudan, making the country a suitable haven for bin Laden to continue his activities from. The Saudi Mujahideen was invited to Sudan personally by Hassan al-Turabi, the speaker of the Sudanese National Assembly and the second most powerful figure within Sudan next to al-Bashir. Here, bin Laden was soon established in his own well-defended compound, with his followers within Al-Qaeda defending the site with advanced weaponry. New training bases for Mujahideen were established near the capital of Khartoum, and bin Laden had a manor in the city. As a result of the free reign he was given in Sudan, the country was designated as a state sponsor of international terrorism, as in the aftermath of the Gulf War. Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda had come under increasing observation by the American Intelligence Service and the State Department. Thus, while Bin Laden remained in Sudan from 1992 to 1996, the US was monitoring his activities on an almost daily basis with flyovers of his compound and other intelligence gathering. By 1996, US sanctions against Sudan over its harboring of Bin Laden and many other prominent Islamic fundamentalists and terrorists 
had begun to damage considerably the country's economy. Moreover, the president Omar al-Bashir had outflanked bin Laden's primary supporter within the government Hassan al-Turabi. Consequently, it was made clear to bin Laden by 1996 that Sudan was no longer a safe refuge. As a result of the expulsion, he headed that year back to Afghanistan, where the Taliban had just cemented its control over much of the country. There he became the personal guest of Mullah Muhammad Umar, the first leader of the Taliban government after seizing power. He quickly issued a declaration of war against the United States in August 1996 through various Islamic media channels, arguing that the US had occupied Saudi Arabia through its military bases since 1990 and that it was the principal supporter of Israel in the region. It has been speculated that bin Laden's actions in 1996 were owing to the loss of much of his wealth from his family background when he left Sudan, and that the expulsion order served to radicalize bin Laden further and set him on a path of all-out war with the government of the United States, the sanctions of which against Sudan had pressured the Sudanese government into the stance it took. From his return to Afghanistan in 1996 onwards, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were wholly committed to confrontational terrorist actions towards the United States in particular. These had always been a part of the organization's modus operandi. As early as 1990, the Federal Bureau of Investigation had raided the home of El Sayed Nazer, an Al-Qaeda affiliate in New Jersey, where they had discovered documents concerning plans to blow up skyscrapers in New York City. In 1993, a truck bomb was detonated outside the North Tower of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. The leader of the attack was Ramzi Yusuf, another known affiliate of Al-Qaeda who had trained in one of their camps in Afghanistan in the late 1980s. In 1992, Bin Laden had financed and organized the bombing of the Gold Mihor Hotel in the city of Aden in Yemen. It is also widely believed that Al-Qaeda was involved in the Luxor massacre of November 1997 when 62 individuals, most of them Western tourists, were killed in the Egyptian city near the Valley of the Kings by six Islamic fundamentalist gunmen. Thus, by the second half of the 1990s, Al-Qaeda was stepping up its attacks on Western targets through terrorist methods. These attacks soon escalated even further. On the 7th of August 1998, simultaneous truck bombings occurred in the cities of Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania, and the capital of Kenya, Nairobi. There was no doubt which nation the symbolic target of these attacks was, as the bombs were detonated outside the United States embassies in the two capital cities. These were complex terrorist attacks. For instance, the bombing in Nairobi involved 500 cylinders of TNT, while the Dar es Salaam bombing was undertaken with two 2,000-pound bombs. Ammonium nitrate fertilizer was used to pack and direct the blast so that it caused maximum damage to the embassies. Moreover, both bombs were detonated almost simultaneously, resulting in the deaths of 213 people in Nairobi and 85 in Dar es Salaam, while thousands more were injured. There is no doubt also that bin Laden and al-Qaeda were responsible and in the immediate aftermath of the bombings, bin Laden was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted individuals list. It also brought al-Qaeda to the attention of all intelligence services in the Western world, though unfortunately the risk which was posed by the terrorist organization was still not fully grasped. In the aftermath of the US Embassy's bombings, bin Laden continued to escalate his rhetoric against the United States. His grievances were multifarious, including US support for Israel and for a number of regimes who were persecuting Muslims within their borders, notably Russia's crackdown on Chechnya, the Philippine government's attacks on the Muslim Moro population of the Southern Islands, and India's oppression of Muslims in the Kashmir region in the north of the country. However, his foremost complaint was with the presence of American troops in the Arabian Peninsula and their proximity to the holiest places of Islam, Mecca and Medina. In 1998, Al-Qaeda stated that, quote, For seven years the United States has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of place. Thus, 
after the already sizable attacks on the U.S. embassies, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda turned their attention to an even more substantial attack, this time on American soil. Remarkably, they decided to target the World Trade Center in New York City, which associates of Al-Qaeda had already tried to attack with a truck bomb back in 1993. The second attempt would be more devastating. Late in 1998 or early 1999, Bin Laden gave his approval to the World Trade Center initiative, which had first been proposed by an Al-Qaeda affiliate, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, in 1996. The remainder of 1999 saw potential candidates to carry out the attacks being screened in Afghanistan. A prerequisite for the leaders were that they needed to be able to speak English and be familiar with living in Western society for a time. A number of individuals such as Mohammed Atta, Marwan al Sheikhi, and Ziad Jara were quickly selected. Another one, Hani Hanjur, was picked once it was realized that he had a commercial pilot's license and was a skilled airplane pilot. By 2000, 19 individuals had been selected and were being established in terrorist cells in the United States, operating in Arizona, Florida, and California. Final targets were selected in early 2001, with the intention being to hijack a number of commercial airline planes and fly them into buildings in suicide terrorist attacks. The Twin Towers, the two central buildings of the World Trade Center, were the primary targets, while the Pentagon in Virginia was also a target. It is also believed there were plans to fly a fourth plane into the U.S. Capitol building, the seat of government in Washington, D.C. With the plan in place and terrorist cells in position in the U.S. to carry it out, a date was fixed for the simultaneous attacks. The day chosen was the 11th of September 2001. It is a popular belief that this date was chosen as September is the ninth month of the year and the date when written out using the American dating system comes out as 9-11, the same number used for emergency call services in the United States. However, it seems more likely that Bin Laden chose the 11th of September as it was the day in 1683 that John Sobieski III, the King of Poland, arrived at Vienna, the capital of Austria, which was under siege by the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The siege was broken by Sobieski, marking the conclusion of Ottoman expansion in southern Europe. Prior to it, the Christian world had been under pressure for centuries from Muslim expansion in the eastern Mediterranean and the Balkans. But after the siege of Vienna, the Christian Western powers began to encroach into the Muslim world. Bin Laden chose this symbolic date as a statement that these attacks on the United States by Al-Qaeda in 2001 would mark a new turning of the tide back in favor of Islam. On the morning of the 11th of September 2001, the 19 hijackers operating in independent cells began to implement their orders. Five hijackers boarded American Airlines Flight 11, which was scheduled to fly out of Logan International Airport in Boston at 7.59 a.m., bound for Los Angeles International Airport. Five others boarded United Airlines 175, which was making the same journey from Logan to Los Angeles. That plane took off from the runway in Boston 15 minutes after American Airlines Flight 11. Meanwhile, six minutes later, at 8.20 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 took off from Washington Dulles International Airport in Virginia, not far from Washington, D.C. Five hijackers were also on board. Finally, 22 minutes after this, at 8.42 a.m., a fourth plane, United Airlines Flight 93 departed from Newark International Airport in New Jersey, bound for San Francisco. There were just four hijackers on this plane. What followed was a day of infamy. Within minutes of becoming airborne, the hijackers on all four planes were moving to take over the aircrafts. As a result, at 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center traveling at a speed of approximately 750 kilometers per hour. While people all over Manhattan wondered if this could have been an accident, United Airlines Flight 175 was changing direction in the skies. At 9.03 a.m., 17 minutes after the first plane had hit the North Tower, 
it crashed into the South Tower at a speed of 800 kilometers per hour. Just over a half an hour later, American Airlines Flight 77 hit the west wall of the Pentagon in Virginia. Only United Airlines Flight 93 missed its target as it crashed into a field in Pennsylvania while the passengers were attempting to wrest control of it from the hijackers. The plane crashes were only the beginning of the carnage. When the planes struck the Twin Towers, well over 10,000 people were already inside beginning their day's work. With the elevators crippled by the damage from the initial impact and fires devastating the upper floors, the evacuation efforts could only proceed at a moderate pace as people had to head down dozens of staircases. The upper stories where the planes had hit were turned into an inferno, and within minutes, many of those who were still alive were jumping to their deaths. The South Tower, which had been hit second, collapsed at 9.59 a.m. It was followed 29 minutes later by the North Tower. In total, it is believed that 2,606 people lost their lives in the towers and on the ground, along with 147 passengers and crew on the two planes. The damage at the Pentagon was less severe, but even here, 125 died on the ground, along with 59 crew and passengers. The 40 crew and passengers on United Airlines Flight 93 all lost their lives. The September 11, 2001 attacks, accordingly, were the most devastating terrorist attacks in world history. Moreover, because media outlets had begun covering the story within minutes around the world and footage of the planes striking the towers was soon available, the psychological impact of the attacks was unparalleled as an act of terrorism. At first, Bin Laden denied having been involved in planning the 9-11 attacks on the United States. On the 16th of September, a statement was made by him, which was subsequently broadcast by Al Jazeera, in which he denied responsibility. However, in the months and years that followed, a growing amount of evidence was produced to substantiate an American intelligence services claim that he and Al-Qaeda had orchestrated the attacks. In 2004, Al Jazeera released a new video from him in which he unequivocally stated that he had been responsible for directing the 19 hijackers who boarded the four planes on the 11th of September 2001. This was supplemented by further admissions in 2006 and the surfacing of video footage in which Osama was seen conversing with some of the hijackers in the period leading up to the attacks. In the course of these, it was also stated by Bin Laden that his purpose in targeting the Twin Towers was to seek symbolic revenge for the destruction of numerous towers and multi-story buildings in Beirut in 1982 during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. At the time of the 9-11 attacks, Bin Laden was believed to be hiding in the White Mountains to the south of the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan in the east of the country near the border with Pakistan. The administration of the US President George W. Bush moved quickly to pass a joint congressional resolution on the 18th of September 2001, authorizing the use of force against those who were deemed to be responsible for the 9-11 attacks. As the Taliban regime in Afghanistan had sheltered bin Laden and Al-Qaeda since 1996 and refused to hand him over to American authorities, the regime as a whole was deemed to be a target. American and British aircraft consequently began bombing strategic targets in Afghanistan on the 7th of October 2001. Ties were established with the Northern Alliance, which held parts of the north of the country against the Taliban. In tandem, US special operatives had been inserted into the country in small numbers as early as late September. But it was not until the 19th of October that the principal land invasion began as American troops, with allied contingents from dozens of other nations, began entering Afghanistan in large numbers. The war in Afghanistan resulted in a swift initial victory for the United States and its allies. By early November, American forces had encircled the capital, Kabul. An airstrike on the city on the 12th of November succeeded in killing one of bin Laden's closest allies, the number three figure within Al-Qaeda, Mohammed Atef. The following day, Northern Alliance and US troops began entering the city as the Taliban either fled into the mountains or towards the southern city of Kandahar. 
It was in the latter city that the Taliban made their last major stand in late November. The remaining forces there surrendered in early December, ostensibly bringing the war to an end. It was also in early December that a new interim administration was established with Hamid Karzai as the first president of a new Afghanistan. However, this initial victory was effectively a false dawn, and Afghanistan would soon be riddled with insurgent revolts, which the US would never be able to defeat. The invasion of Afghanistan had also failed to bring bin Laden to justice. The US, though, had come tantalizingly close. Just as Kandahar was falling to the west, a group of several hundred Allied fighters, including 70 US Special Forces and dozens of other special operatives, along with a few hundred Northern Alliance fighters, conducted a campaign in the Tora Bora cave complex in the White Mountains, where bin Laden and many other Al-Qaeda members were believed to be hiding. A near two-week battle followed in the mountains and caves, a conflict which has become known as the Battle of Tora Bora. American intelligence services believe bin Laden was present during these clashes, but that he escaped as the Allied military presence was insufficient to apprehend him. He is believed to have made his way over the southern border into Pakistan in the days or weeks that followed. By now, bin Laden was the most wanted man in the world, with a bounty of $25 million on offer by the US government for information leading to his capture or death. That figure would be increased to $50 million in 2007 as the manhunt for the leader of Al-Qaeda and the architect of the 9-11 attacks continued. However, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda would pose a threat to America and the Western world for many years to come. Bin Laden's whereabouts in the years following his escape from Afghanistan in the winter of 2001 have been a matter of widespread speculation. By this time, he was the world's most wanted man and well-known all over the world. As such, his movements were secretive, and even the US intelligence services today can only patch together some of his whereabouts during the 2000s. Evidently, he, along with many other senior Al-Qaeda affiliates, spent the vast majority of these years in Pakistan. His presence here was not officially tolerated by the Pakistani government. Successive regimes in the capital Islamabad had been effectively supporters of Islamic terrorist organizations over the years, but in bin Laden's case, it was not possible for them to approve of his presence on Pakistani soil. Nevertheless, a light-touch approach to apprehending bin Laden, even when it was clear that he was in hiding in the country, was adopted, one which meant that the US intelligence services had to try to locate the terrorist leader within the country, with lukewarm support from the Pakistani security services at best. For much of the time after his initial flight from Afghanistan, he is believed to have been in Waziristan, the mountainous region of northern Pakistan near the Afghan border. Reports in the second half of the 2000s sometimes placed him as having moved over the western border to Iran, but these were probably spurious and the reality is that bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were able to live in Pakistan largely unharassed and in some comfort for years with the tacit support of powerful elements within Pakistan's politics and security services. During this time, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda continued to organize terrorist activities throughout the wider Muslim world. Attacks on the United States became much more difficult in the aftermath of 9-11 as a massive security apparatus was put in place in American airports and other locations. However, there was no shortage of Western targets now in the Middle East. Firstly, Afghanistan had been occupied by American, British and other Allied troops in late 2001, and they would remain there in one form or another for the next 20 years. But the more intense Western presence was soon to be found in Iraq. Following the initial victory over the Taliban in Afghanistan, the administration of President George W. Bush in the US began making it clear that it intended to engage in further regime change in the Middle East, targeting states which it deemed to be supporters of terrorism. The regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, who had clung on to power following the Gulf War, was a noted priority, 
This policy would not meet with as much support from America's allies as the invasion of Afghanistan, with countries like France arguing that the Bush administration was now using the 9-11 attacks as a smokescreen for regime change in oil-producing countries and a form of US neo-imperialism in the region. Despite these reservations, the US and Britain, with several other smaller allied nations, invaded Iraq in March 2003, claiming that Hussein's regime was trying to obtain weapons of mass destruction and was a supporter of bin Laden's. Bin Laden had often cited the crippling economic sanctions which the US had imposed on Iraq following the Gulf War as one of his grievances against America, but there is no substantive evidence to show that the Hussein regime had ever materially supported bin Laden in any significant manner. The invasion proceeded much as it had in Afghanistan. A swift victory was won over the Ba'athist regime of Saddam Hussein, and within two months, President Bush announced US victory in the war. But it was not so simple. And as in Afghanistan, a vicious counterinsurgency campaign began in the summer of 2003 and lasted for years as many elements within Iraq tried to remove US forces from the country. Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were involved in this internecine conflict. Their methods focused on trying to sow divisions between the Sunni Muslim minority and the Shiite Muslim majority in an effort to foment a civil war across Iraq. Traditional terrorist methods were employed such as the bombing of the Al-Askari Shrine in the city of Samara on the 22nd of February 2006. While this action did not result in widespread loss of human life, it did see the destruction of one of the holiest places in Iraq for Shiite Muslims and triggered days of sectarian violence in Baghdad and elsewhere in which at least a thousand people lost their lives. Eventually, by the late 2000s, the war in Iraq began to stabilize as a significant American troop surge in 2007, combined with political reforms, served to quell the worst of the violence. Nevertheless, Al-Qaeda continued their campaign, and from Pakistan, bin Laden sanctioned bombings in Baghdad and a suicide bombing on the Shiite Imam Hussein shrine in the city of Karbala in March 2008 which resulted in 42 deaths and the injuring of dozens of others. Meanwhile, back in Pakistan, bin Laden had moved into a new purpose-built compound in the city of Abbottabad in northern Pakistan. Construction on this had evidently begun shortly after bin Laden arrived in the country at the beginning of 2002, and it was completed in 2005. The compound was laid out on a 38,000 square foot estate and was surrounded by a concrete perimeter fence up to five and a half meters high and topped with barbed wire. There were few windows here and many screens to block vision of the interior, including a screen on a third floor balcony tall enough to ensure privacy there for Bin Laden, who was six foot four inches tall. It is hard to believe the authorities could have failed to recognize how unusual the new property was and it was clearly built with security in mind. Bin Laden was probably living there from 2006 onwards with some of his wives, children and followers in a city not far from the Pakistan capital Islamabad. While Bin Laden's compound sheltered him in Pakistan for many years, eventually his over-reliance on it would be his undoing. In 2009, US intelligence services determined that Abu Ahmad al-Kuwaiti a close confidant of bin Laden's, who is believed to have been with him at the Battle of Tora Bora in December 2001, when the terrorist leader narrowly avoided apprehension by the US, had begun to work as a trusted courier and messenger for bin Laden while he was in hiding in Pakistan. In 2009, the CIA determined that al-Kuwaiti was living in Abbottabad, Further intelligence gathering led them to identify the Bin Laden compound as a peculiar building in the city. Tens of millions of dollars of funding were obtained from the US Congress to finance the establishment of a CIA team on the ground in Abbottabad, which in 2010 began monitoring the compound and those who entered and left it. Despite this extensive initiative, 
and the use of the most sophisticated drone and surveillance devices available anywhere in the world, the team was never able to obtain a photograph or any other evidence which concretely established that bin Laden was living within the compound. But by early 2011, the range of circumstantial evidence was such that they were convinced that this was the hideout of the architect of the 9-11 attacks. US President Barack Obama authorized what was codenamed Operation Neptune Spear on the 1st of May 2011. It was lunchtime in Washington, D.C. But only half an hour later, at nearly 11 p.m. at night in Afghanistan, two Black Hawk helicopters carrying two dozen Navy SEALs took off from an American airbase in Afghanistan and flew over the border to Pakistan. Just over an hour and a half later, at what was half past midnight in Pakistan on the 2nd of May, the helicopters landed in the compound at Abbottabad. One of the helicopters crashed during the landing, but none of the Navy SEALs were injured. Fighting commenced as soon as they landed with a brief firefight with some of Bin Laden's followers. Then the Navy SEALs proceeded into the main compound. Back in Washington, D.C., President Obama and senior government and defense officials watched live footage of the raid from the Situation Room in the White House. On the second floor, the Navy SEALs encountered and shot one of Bin Laden's many adult sons, as well as another follower, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, whose presence in Abbottabad had first suggested to security services that bin Laden might be sheltering in the city. Then, as they headed upstairs again, they found bin Laden on the third floor. Their orders were to kill rather than apprehend the Al-Qaeda leader. There are conflicting accounts as to what then occurred, as different Navy SEALs have sought to claim credit for killing bin Laden. But it seems most likely that it was Matt Bissonnette, who shot bin Laden at 39 minutes past midnight local time, in the body and head, in the doorway of his bedroom. And he then staggered backwards into the room and fell to the floor, dead. Bin Laden was found to have 500 euros and two mobile phones sewn into his robes, no doubt for use if he found himself fleeing an attack on the compound, such as the one which led to his death. It was a rather pathetic demise. A decision had been taken in advance that bin Laden's body would be disposed of quickly somewhere where his resting place would never be identified and turned into a shrine for Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists. Thus, shortly after he was killed and the compound was fully secured, the Navy SEALs placed the Al-Qaeda leader's corpse in a body bag and then brought it out to the helicopter that was still intact. After a sweep of the compound to gather any intelligence which might be useful for offsetting further terrorist attacks or establishing a more concrete idea of what bin Laden had been doing over the years, the team exited the compound with the body on the sole functioning helicopter. A backup helicopter was called in to collect some of the remaining Navy SEALs. By 8 p.m. back in Washington, it had been confirmed that the body was that of bin Laden. President Obama addressed the nation a few hours later to announce news of the raid's success. As he was doing so, bin Laden's body was being taken out to some undisclosed location at sea and was disposed of there, weighted down with iron chains and rocks to ensure it sank to the sea floor. This was done within 24 hours of his death to comply with Islamic tradition. Sadly, the death of Osama bin Laden did not lead to any reduction in the threat which Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists posed to the Western world, or indeed to most Muslims in the Islamic world. As brutal as their tactics were, Al-Qaeda was already being eclipsed by more extreme jihadi movements by the time of bin Laden's death. In 2004, a Jordanian jihadist by the name of Abu Musab al-Zakawi had become an associate of Al-Qaeda in Iraq during the early stages of the counter-insurgency against the US occupation. In 2006, al-Zarqawi and several of his closest allies merged to form what they called the Islamic State of Iraq. In the years that followed, they went from strength to strength, but their methods also became ever more brutal. 
including the use of vicious tactics against Muslims who refuse to live according to anything other than the most severe forms of Sharia law. By the time US forces were withdrawn from Iraq in the early 2010s, Al-Qaeda were increasingly unwilling to tolerate this approach to jihad in the Middle East, and a full split followed between the two organizations in the years following bin Laden's death under Al-Qaeda's new leader, Ayman al-Zahwari. Incredibly, by the 2010s, Al-Qaeda, the organization who carried out the 9-11 attacks, was being seen as too moderate by many Islamic fundamentalists, and the Islamic State of Iraq group were now garnering many more followers amongst would-be jihadists. In the years that followed, Islamic State of Iraq burst onto the consciousness of the entire world. Following the Arab Spring of 2011, a brutal civil war erupted in Syria, while the US departure from neighboring Iraq saw significant parts of the country fall out of the control of the government in Baghdad. In this environment, Islamic State under its new leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was able to begin taking direct control over a vast swathe of territory across northern Iraq and eastern Syria. In the course of 2014 and 2015, the newly named Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, or ISIL, came to international attention as they declared the establishment of an Islamic Caliphate over the lands they had taken control of. ISIL brought Islamic Jihad to a new level of brutality, which even Al-Qaeda distanced itself from. Gradually, control over eastern Syria and northern Iraq was wrested from ISIL between 2014 and 2017, as the US sent troops back into the region. As of the early 2020s, Islamic fundamentalism would seem to be on the decline, driven in part by rapidly improving living standards in the Middle East, a reduced inclination towards nation-building by the United States in the region, and a warming of relations between Israel and many of its Muslim neighbors. Indeed, the main threat of Islamic fundamentalism seems to have shifted from the Middle East to the Sahel, the region along the southern edge of the Sahara Desert where jihadi groups have undermined the stability of nations like Mali, Niger, Chad, and Burkina Faso. The Taliban has also returned to power in Afghanistan following the US withdrawal in 2021. Osama bin Laden was arguably the most significant figure in the history of modern Islamic fundamentalism. Beginning in the 1970s, he was gradually radicalized through his exposure to the ideas of Islamist scholars such as Saeed Qutb. This growing radicalism combined with the financial power available to him through the enormous bin Laden business empire in Saudi Arabia and the connections he enjoyed throughout Saudi society ensured that when the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan commenced in 1979, he was able to bring extensive powers to bear in training and equipping Mujahideen to fight the Russians throughout the 1980s. Had his career of opposition to non-Muslim incursions into the Islamic world ended there, he would simply be a footnote to history. But once the war against the Soviets wound down, he committed himself to a wider program of Islamic fundamentalism. His actions during the Gulf War highlighted his growing anti-Americanism and his willingness to split with Muslim regimes such as that of the Saudi royal family if they engaged in actions which he deemed antithetical to Islam. Thus, by the 1990s, a more extreme version of bin Laden and al-Qaeda was emerging, as reflected in the increasingly brutal bombing campaigns being launched, the most severe being the US Embassy bombings of 1998, which killed hundreds and injured thousands. But it is ultimately the 9-11 attacks on the United States which bin Laden and Al-Qaeda have become most infamous for. On that fateful September morning in 2001, 19 hijackers acting on bin Laden's orders launched attacks which killed over 2,700 people in the space of a few hours, while thousands more had their lives cut short in the years that followed as a result of ancillary injuries. Just as damaging was the psychological impact. Most people have clear memories of where they were and what they were doing on the 11th of September 2001, as news of the attacks emerged and footage of the planes striking the Twin Towers surfaced on news outlets. 
Life changed in many ways that day, as additional security measures were imposed across the Western world to combat future attacks. Wars followed in the Middle East, and for years there was hardly a week went by when news of a major incident in Afghanistan, Iraq or somewhere was on the front pages of newspapers. All of this culminated in the rise of ISIL and a migrant crisis in the Mediterranean as millions of people sought to flee from Syria and Iraq. By that time, bin Laden was dead, killed in a rather ignominious end in a fortified compound he had been holed up in in Abbottabad for half a decade. But the world had been changed immeasurably by his violent extremism. What do you think of Osama bin Laden? Would it have been better for him to have been captured alive and placed on trial for his crimes? Please let us know in the comment section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The woman known to history as Golda Meir was born Golda Mabovic on the 3rd of May 1898 in Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, then part of the Russian Empire. Her father was Moshe Mabovic. He was the son of a soldier in the Russian army who studied at a prestigious religious school in Slonim in western Belarus, but eventually trained as a carpenter. Her mother was Bloom Nidic, and the couple would have eight children, of whom three daughters survived into adulthood. The eldest surviving daughter, Shana, was born in 1889. Golda was born nine years later in 1898, and the youngest daughter, Zipka, also known as Clara, was born in 1902. They were born into a Jewish family and were brought up in Pinsk in modern-day Belarus, part of the Pale of Settlement on the Russian Empire's western frontier, which the Jewish population had been confined to since the late 18th century. Soon after Golda's birth, her paternal grandmother, Zipi, arrived in Kyiv to take charge of the household, causing conflict with her mother Bloom concerning the upbringing of the children. Golda later recalled that her earliest memories included witnessing arguments between her mother and grandmother. After the birth of her younger sister, Zipa, in 1902, Golda's upbringing was entrusted to her 12-year-old sister, Shana. She had an unhappy childhood, growing up in poverty and surrounded by the bickering women of three different generations, her grandmother, mother, and elder sister. In early 1903, Moshe Mabovich moved the family back to Pinsk, where Golda lived with her Nidic grandparents. The spring of 1903 witnessed a new wave of political violence against Jews sparked off by an anti-Jewish riot or pogrom in Kishinev, the capital of present-day Moldova, in April 1903. A few weeks later, in response to rumors of an imminent pogrom in Pinsk, Musha made preparations by barricading the door with wooden planks while the teenage Shana took a kitchen knife for self-defense. Golda and her baby sister Zipke were taken upstairs and looked after by neighbors. Although the pogrom never materialized, the fear and trepidation experienced by the five-year-old Golda during the ordeal remained with her for the rest of her life. Not long afterwards, Moshe made the fateful decision to join tens of thousands of fellow Russian Jews in emigrating to the United States. As was the custom at the time, he would leave alone, find a job, and save up money to bring the rest of his family across the ocean. While the family awaited word from Moshe, Shana joined a group of politically active high school students who discussed what the Jews could do to end the anti-Semitic discrimination they were facing. A tiny minority of Jews were drawn towards Zionism, the ideology championed by the journalist Theodor Herzl from Vienna, who called for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine 
then ruled by the Islamic Ottoman Empire, which governed Turkey and the Middle East from its capital in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. Following the Kishinev pogrom, Herzl wrote to the British colonial secretary Joseph Chamberlain about the creation of a temporary Jewish state in Uganda, but the proposal was not taken forward. In the meantime, many Jews were drawn to socialist and Marxist doctrines which aimed to unite the working class and overthrow the Russian monarchy under Tsar Nicholas II, creating a new state free of prejudice and discrimination. Although there was a mutual antagonism between the working classes and the Jews due to the role of Jewish bankers, many socialist leaders were Jews. Shana and her group were supporters of both Zionism and socialism and had a great influence on Golda's political upbringing. Although Bloom was concerned about Shana's political activities and feared that the family might be targeted by the Tsarist state, the teenager defied her mother and continued to attend political meetings. Shana was also responsible for teaching her sister to read and write, alongside basic arithmetic. When Herzl died in 1904 at the age of 44, Shana wore black in mourning for over two years. In the meantime, after first arriving in New York, Mersha Mabovich moved to Milwaukee in the state of Wisconsin, where he adopted the name Morris and found a job working on the railroad. By 1906, he was in a position to send for his wife and daughters. Traveling with forged documents, Golda accompanied her mother and sisters out of Russia initially to Vienna before taking a train to Antwerp in Belgium and boarding a steamer across the Atlantic. After arriving in Quebec, two weeks later, the family continued by train until they arrived in Milwaukee in June 1906. Eight-year-old Golda Mabovich was not unhappy to leave Eastern Europe behind and would have much fonder memories of the United States, where she would spend the next 15 years of her life. Within days of arriving in Milwaukee, Bloom decided to open a grocery store assisted by Shana while the two younger daughters went to school. Between 1906 and 1912, Golda attended the Fourth Street School, now known as the Golda Meir School after its most famous alumna. While Golda was happy enough to be among Milwaukee's Jewish community without the risk of being targeted by pogroms, Shana resented having to work with her mother and briefly escaped to Chicago to work at a clothing factory. By contrast, Golda was enjoying her studies and soon came to be top of her class. She was also gaining recognition outside the classroom, and in 1909, at the age of 11, she and her best friend Regina Hamburger set up the American Young Sisters Society to raise money to buy textbooks for their poorer classmates. As the only fluent English speaker in her family, she helped recently arrived Jewish immigrants find jobs and encouraged them to join labor unions. The Mabovich home hosted meetings of the local branch of Pole Zion, or the Workers of Zion, a labor Zionist organization that combined Zionist and socialist ideas. As her father and her sister were both members, in 1912, the 14-year-old Golda joined the organization in her own right. Although Golda graduated as a valedictorian from her elementary school in 1912, her conservative parents wanted her to stay at home and await marriage to a successful man. Encouraged by her sister, Golda insisted on continuing her education and enrolled in North Division High School in the autumn. By this time, Shana had moved to Denver to recover from a bout of tuberculosis, following which she married Shamai Korngold, an old acquaintance from Pinsk. Within months of Golda starting high school, Bloom informed her that she had found her the perfect husband a 30-year-old man named Mr. Goodstein, who worked in real estate. 
horrified at the idea of marrying a man twice her age, a desperate Golda wrote to the Corngolds, who responded by inviting her to stay with them in Denver. With assistance from her friend Regina, Golda escaped from her parents' house in February 1913 and took the train to Denver. She enrolled in the Northside High School and spent her evenings discussing politics at the Corngold's house with the local Jewish community. Shana criticized Golda for being too friendly with the men at the social gatherings and encouraged her to concentrate on her studies. Golda refused, increasing tensions between the two sisters until one day in 1914, when Golda decided to move out of the Corngold's house, renting a small apartment while working in a department store. At around this time, she began dating Morris Meyerson, a 21-year-old sign painter and socialist activist who sparked her interest in music and poetry. The following year, Golda's parents wrote to her, asking her to come back home to resume her education. She agreed to do so and returned to North Division and graduated in 1916, while Morris remained in Denver, writing her several letters a week. In Milwaukee, Golda maintained a close interest in European affairs during the First World War. The fighting between the Russian Empire and the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary on the Eastern Front displaced millions of Jews from the Pale, and Golda joined her father in raising funds to support Jewish refugees. She joined the executive committee of her local Polish Zion branch, strengthening her belief in Zionism and fueling a desire to move to Palestine. By 1916, Golda was reunited with Meyerson, who had moved to Milwaukee, to join her. He did not share Golda's enthusiasm about Palestine and hoped to build a life in America. After Golda issued an ultimatum to Morris, refusing to marry him until he agreed to move to Palestine with her, he eventually gave in, and the couple were married on the 24th of December 1917. After Germany resumed unrestricted submarine warfare in January 1917, prompting the United States to join Britain, France, and a collapsing Russia in the First World War, transatlantic shipping was cancelled, and the newly married couple was unable to travel to Palestine. Golda was optimistic about the Zionist cause after British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour's declaration of November 1917 announced British support for the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine that protected the rights of the non-Jewish population in the region. While Golda had a job in the local library, she spent most of her time doing political work for Polo Zion. After the end of the First World War in November 1918, the American Jewish Congress was established to determine a united American Jewish position in advance of the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. Golda was elected to the body and joined her fellow Zionists in demanding that Palestine should be given to Britain as a mandate under the newly created League of Nations to implement the Balfour Declaration. After the meeting of the Congress, Golda was invited by the National Polo Zion Organization to go on a fundraising tour across the country. Against the wishes of her husband, her parents, and her sister Shana, she enthusiastically accepted and only returned to Milwaukee on occasion. As the Zionists had hoped, Britain was granted the mandate for Palestine and in the summer of 1921, Golda and Morris were finally able to make the journey. They were part of a group of 17 Jewish pioneers, including Shana and Shammai Korngold, and their two children, as well as Golda's childhood friend Regina Hamburger. On the 14th of July 1921, they arrived in Tel Aviv, the Jewish settlement founded in 1909 near the port of Jaffa. In contrast to the picture of Palestine Golda had painted for her American audiences, Tel Aviv was a ramshackle little town in the desert. 
Morris soon found a job as a bookkeeper in the ancient city of Lod, ten miles away, while Golda began teaching English. Golda aspired to join a kibbutz, a Jewish collective farm, and applied to the kibbutz Moravia in the Jezreel Valley to the north. The Meerson's application was rejected twice by the kibbutz members, but Golda's determination won them admission for a trial period on a third vote. Golda was determined to show her fellow kibbutzniks that she was as capable of agricultural work as anyone else and eagerly joined the communal dinners, while Morris preferred to be alone with his gramophone. Nevertheless, both were admitted to the kibbutz on a permanent basis. At the end of 1921, Golda represented Merevia at the meeting of the kibbutz movement where she was surrounded by influential politicians including David Ben-Gurion, Secretary General of the Histadrut, the General Federation of Labour and leader of the Workers' Party, Adat Ha'avoida, or Unity of Labour. Other influential figures included Bell Katznelson, the intellectual founder of the Labour Zionist movement, and Levi Eshkol, head of Degania Bet Kibbutz. During her address to the conference, Golda was criticized for speaking in her native Yiddish tongue rather than in Hebrew. After returning to Mehavia, she discovered that her husband, Morris, was depressed and suffering from malaria. Nevertheless, she remained committed to her political duties and was soon elected to represent her kibbutz at the Women Workers' Council. As a representative of the council at the second Histadrut Conference in 1923, Golda argued that there was no need for a separate women's council if women could be part of the Histadrut leadership, a suggestion which brought her to the attention of Ben-Gurion and Katznelson. By 1924, Morris refused to continue living in the kibbutz and the couple moved to Tel Aviv and later Jerusalem. While Morris was enchanted by Jerusalem's history and culture, Golda preferred to maintain her connections to the Zionist political center in Tel Aviv. On the 23rd of November 1924, Golda gave birth to a son named Menachem after her maternal grandfather. The couple worked for Solel Bernay, the building cooperative attached to the Histadrut, but the organization was experiencing financial difficulties and paid salaries in vouchers which were not accepted in most shops. In 1925, a frustrated Golda returned briefly to Merhevia, taking six-month-old Menachem with her. But rather than allowing her to work on the farm, the kibbutz members asked her to be the nanny, causing her to return to Jerusalem. After the birth of her daughter, Sarah, in May 1926, Golda swallowed her pride and taught English at a private school. The same year, Golda's parents moved to Palestine and built a home in Herzliya, to the north of Tel Aviv. Despite frequent trips to visit her parents and her sister, Golda remained unhappy and grew distant from her husband. She was rumored to be romantically involved with other men, including David Remes, the head of Solel Bonnet, and a protégé of Bell Katz Nelson. In 1927, Remes offered her the position of Secretary General of the Women's Worker Council in an attempt to strengthen Histradut's control over the organization. Golda was happy to accept the role and moved back to Tel Aviv with her two children leaving her husband behind in Jerusalem. Leaving the children in the care of the kindergarten and babysitters, Golda used her position at the Women's Council to participate in the debates at the Histadrut. The organization served as the vehicle for the creation of the new Jewish state, and Golda was soon asked to return to the United States on fundraising tours promoting Jewish immigration to Palestine. Her American upbringing ensured that she received a popular welcome, and her efforts were recognized by the Histadrut leadership, which also sent her to Western Europe to win the support of socialist organizations in Britain and France. Back in Palestine, Golda witnessed the founding of MAPAI, 
the Workers' Party of the Land of Israel after the merger of the two main socialist parties in the country. In 1932, Golda went to the United States to seek treatment for her daughter's kidney illness and to revitalize the labor Zionist movement. For the next two years, Golda traveled throughout North America, promoting the Zionist cause, describing the exploits of the pioneers who emigrated to Palestine in biblical terms. Her packed schedule allowed her little time to spend with her children, who resented her lengthy absences. When Golda returned to Palestine in 1934, she was appointed to Histadrut's executive council, where she was placed in charge of tourism. Although Ben-Gurion had made significant progress in attracting Jewish settlers and Tel Aviv's population had increased to 150,000, the waves of Jewish immigration provoked riots from the existing majority Arab population. In response to the demonstrations, the British authorities in Palestine sought to limit the number of Jews resettling in Palestine by setting quotas, which were inevitably regarded as too high by the Arabs and too low by the Jews. At the same time, Palestine was receiving a steady stream of Jewish immigrants from Germany after Adolf Hitler's anti-Semitic Nazi party came to power in 1933. While she continued to travel abroad as Histadrut's international representative, part of Golda's work during this period included providing these immigrants with accommodation and jobs as directed by the Jewish Agency, the organization which served as the de facto Jewish government in Palestine. When a new wave of political violence broke out between Arabs and Jews in 1936, the British government dispatched Lord William Peel to chair a commission of inquiry to devise a solution to the Palestine question. After meeting with Arab and Jewish leaders, the Peel Commission decided the best solution was to partition Palestine, establishing a newly independent Jewish state while annexing the majority of the country to the Arab Kingdom of Transjordan to the east. While Ben-Gurion was delighted about the prospect of an independent Jewish state, Golda bitterly rejected the Peel Commission's recommendations for partition, which allocated to the Jews only a quarter of historical Palestine. At the 20th Zionist Congress, held in Zurich in Switzerland in 1937, Golda marshaled opposition to the Peel Commission's proposals by bringing together right-wing Zionists who were unwilling to make any concessions to the Arabs and Jewish socialists who supported a united Palestine with Arabs and Jews living side by side. The Congress endorsed Golda's position and a second British commission, which reported in 1938, rejected partition. In the meantime, the situation for European Jews worsened after Hitler's annexation of Austria and after the threats to incorporate Czechoslovakia into the Nazis' Third Reich in 1938. Golda pleaded with British officials to increase the immigration quota, which had been cut to just over 10,000 in 1937, while at the same time serving as an operative of the Mossad Lialiabet, a secret network that smuggled Jews out of Nazi-occupied Europe. In the summer of 1938, US President Franklin D. Roosevelt called the Avian Conference, bringing together representatives of 32 nations to discuss the situation faced by European Jews. As an observer representing the Jews of Palestine, Golda was angered by the repeated expressions of sympathy for the Jews combined with the refusal to accept a significant number of refugees. In May 1939, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain published a final plan for Palestine which confined the Jewish population to 5% of Palestinian territory and restricted Jewish migration to 75,000 over the next five years. An independent Palestinian state would be established within 10 years, jointly governed by the Arabs and the Jews. 
The Jews in Palestine felt betrayed, and Golda joined Ben-Gurion and Katznelson in leading almost 200,000 Jews in a general strike. At the same time, the Jewish community in Palestine prepared to wage war against both the British and Arabs by establishing Jewish settlements throughout the country. While these plans were being finalized at the 21st Zionist Congress in Vienna in August 1939, a non-aggression pact was signed between representatives of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, the communist state which governed much of the former Russian Empire. On the 1st of September, Hitler invaded Poland a country of four million Jews, leading to the outbreak of the Second World War after Britain and France declared war on Germany. Golda and her colleagues found themselves in the awkward position of encouraging Jews to join the British Army against a possible German invasion while illegally smuggling Jewish refugees into Palestine. As one of the senior leaders of the Jewish community, she served on the British War Economic Advisory Council to help enforce wartime rationing measures among the Jewish population, while also serving as head of Histadrut's political department with responsibility for resolving labor disputes. While the British attempted to crack down on Jewish immigration into Palestine, Hitler's armies were rolling through Europe, forcing the surrender of France in 1940 and launching the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, occupying large parts of Belarus and Ukraine. In the summer of 1942, German and Italian forces in North Africa threatened to strike Egypt and Palestine. When rumors reached Palestine in 1942 that the Germans were sending Polish Jews to concentration camps and exterminating them in gas ovens, Golda was one of the few Jewish leaders who believed them. She attempted to raise funds to provide Jews under Nazi occupation to fight back. And after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April 1943, she offered the services of the Haganah, the Zionist paramilitary organization, to support British secret agents behind enemy lines. Following General Bernard Montgomery's defeat of German and Italian forces at the Second Battle of El Alamein in the autumn of 1942, Palestine was no longer at risk of German invasion, but the war in Europe continued until the Nazi surrender in May 1945. When the Allied armies liberated over 600,000 Jews from concentration camps across Europe, Golda and her colleagues sought to find a new home for them in Palestine. The Zionists were encouraged by the British Labour Party's election victory in July 1945, bringing to power a party that had consistently supported a Jewish state in Palestine. When Prime Minister Clement Attlee and Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin sought to retain their Conservative predecessor's policy in Palestine, the Jews felt betrayed once again. To Golda's dismay, the Haganah had joined two right-wing guerrilla groups in the Jewish resistance movement, but after Bevin had announced his policy, Golda endorsed violent resistance, sparking a civil war between Jewish fighters and British authorities. The United States government was far more sympathetic to the Zionists, and following American intervention, the British agreed to establish an Anglo-American Commission which met in early 1946. On the 25th of March 1946, Golda addressed the Commission, describing the persecution and terror the Jews had faced in Europe even before Hitler's rise to power, and argued, that the only solution for the senselessness of Jewish life and Jewish death lay in creating an independent Jewish life in a Jewish homeland. On the 1st of May, the Commission recommended the continuation of the British mandate in Palestine while calling for the British to approve 100,000 visas for Jews. 
When the British government refused to grant the visas, the conflict on the ground in Palestine intensified. After a British crackdown on the leadership of the Jewish agency, Golda became head of the organization's political department in June 1946. While she struggled to reconcile her revulsion to terrorist activity and her determination to resist the British presence in Palestine, in February 1947, the Attlee government changed course and referred the Palestinian question to the United Nations. In September, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine proposed partition with the city of Jerusalem under international jurisdiction. Under the proposals, the Arabs would receive a 43% share of the Palestinian land, with the Jews obtaining 56%, a large part of which included the uninhabited Negev Desert. While the Zionists were happy to accept these proposals, most of Palestine's Arab neighbors rejected the UN plan with the exception of King Abdullah of Transjordan, who aspired to the leadership of the Arab world and was prepared to support a Jewish state in return for Jewish support of Jordanian annexation of Arab Palestine. When the Jordanian king proposed secret negotiations with the Palestinian Jews in November 1947, he was surprised that the Jews had sent a female envoy in the form of Golda Meirson. While Abdullah hoped to annex the whole of Palestine before carving out an autonomous Jewish state, Golda was pleased to hear that he had no desire to join his fellow Arab leaders in resisting a Jewish state by military force. When the UN General Assembly met at the end of November, Golda held the fort in Palestine while her colleagues were in New York, and on the 29th of November, the General Assembly passed a resolution endorsing the partition plan with 33 votes in favor, 13 against, and 10 abstentions. While the Palestinian Jews cheered their victory, Arab guerrilla fighters began to attack Jewish settlements. Golda was placed in charge of the defense of the city of Jerusalem and exposed herself to danger by frequently going to and from Tel Aviv, crossing through territory occupied by hostile Arabs. In January 1948, Golda once again returned to the United States to lead a fundraising campaign to acquire weapons for the Haganah. Referencing the six million Jews killed by the Nazis during the Holocaust, she persuaded wealthy Jewish businessmen to contribute to the cause, raising $15 million by the beginning of February. By the time she returned to Jerusalem in March, she had raised over $50 million, allowing the Haganah to continue its resistance and enabling Ben-Gurion to order a counteroffensive in April that broke the siege of Jerusalem. While Golda was disappointed that she was not appointed to the new Jewish National Administration, formed in March, on the 10th of May, she met King Abdullah for the second time, this time in his capital of Amman. While the king still seemed keen to stay out of the war, Golda was frustrated by his suggestion that the Jews should wait a few years before full independence. On the 14th of May 1948, in anticipation of the expiry of the British mandate the following day, David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of the State of Israel in Tel Aviv. The 37 members of the Israeli parliament, the National Council, attached their signatures to the Declaration of Independence. Among the names was Golda Meirson, who had recently celebrated her 50th birthday. She had been in Palestine for 27 years, during which time she had gradually climbed the ranks within Jewish political organizations to become one of its leaders and a close ally of Ben-Gurion's. Although she was not formally a member of Ben-Gurion's cabinet, she nevertheless attended meetings and made her voice heard. Soon after the declaration of Israeli statehood, she returned to the United States 
and raised another $75 million for the cause. Despite being hospitalized in a car crash in New York, Golda was then asked to travel to Moscow as Israel's ambassador to the Soviet Union. While the Soviet Union and the United States had been allies against Germany in the Second World War, by the late 1940s the wartime alliance had collapsed, making way for the Cold War, an ideological struggle between Soviet communism and American capitalism for global influence. The Soviets supported Israeli statehood and provided arms to the Israeli Defense Forces, the official successor to the Haganah. After presenting her credentials in September 1948, Golda initiated talks with the Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov about trade and economic aid to Israel, but the Soviet economy had been shattered during the war and the Soviets were unwilling to make any major commitments. Furthermore, Soviet support for Israeli statehood was motivated primarily by a desire to expel the British from the Middle East and Stalin believed that Israel would be an American satellite. While she struggled to make progress in Moscow, Golda regretted being away from home, where the Israeli military had taken control of Galilee in the north and driven the Egyptians out of the Negev desert in the south. It only remained for the Arabs to admit defeat. In Moscow, Golda considered it her duty to reach out to the three million Jews in the Soviet Union many of whom wished to emigrate to Israel. She struggled to do so until Molotov's Jewish wife, Polina Zemchuzina, advised her to go to Moscow's synagogue. While Zemchuzina would soon be arrested and exiled to Kazakhstan, in January 1949, Golda went to the synagogue to mark Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, where tens of thousands of Jews acclaimed her in a demonstration of support for Israel. Within weeks, Stalin began to crack down on the Jews, and in February, Golda was recalled to Israel to serve as Minister for Labor. In March, Golda returned to Israel to take up her position at the Ministry of Labor, where she was responsible for providing homes and jobs to the hundreds of thousands of Jews arriving in Israel. In the Knesset, the new parliament, she announced plans to build 30,000 new houses, promising to raise the money in the United States. Despite being asked for funds for the Israeli military and for social welfare, the American Jews agreed to finance the construction project by buying bonds backed by the Israeli government. When she returned to Israel, she proposed an ambitious infrastructure construction project to tackle the unemployment problem, which included the repair of roads damaged during the recent war. In 1950, she returned to America, seeking $15 billion over the next 15 years via government bonds. Back at home, she continued to encourage Jewish immigration into Israel despite the pressure on the existing state infrastructure. While she labored to develop the Israeli economy, in May 1951, Golda received news that her husband, Morris, had died of a heart attack. Weeks later, her political mentor and close confidant, David Remes, was also dead. Casting aside these personal tragedies, Golda worked 19 hours a day to build a social democratic state in Israel. In January 1952, she proposed a national insurance program to provide financial support for women, children and the elderly. Despite resistance from the finance minister Levi Eshkol, the Minister of Labor prevailed. In 1953, she successfully passed a bill introducing national service for women in hospitals and schools, but not without angering the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. In 1955, when Golda was asked by Ben-Gurion to run as Mapai's candidate for mayor of Tel Aviv, she lost out after two conservative Orthodox representatives voted in favor of the incumbent. Although a United Nations brokered ceasefire had been in place since July 1949, 
Arab insurgents, or Fedayeen, continued to launch attacks into Israeli territory. Frustrated by the constant incursions, in October 1953, Moshe Dayan, the belligerent chief of operations of the Israeli Defense Forces, sent a force of crack troops commanded by Ariel Sharon to launch a retaliatory attack on the Fedayeen base at Kibia in Jordan, killing 69 civilians. The incident sparked a series of disagreements between Ben-Gurion and his foreign minister Moshe Sheret, who deplored the disproportionate use of force employed by the Israeli Defense Forces. During the power struggle, Ben-Gurion resigned from the premiership in January 1954 and was replaced by Sharet. But by late 1955, he was back in the top job and sought to consolidate his authority. In June 1956, shortly after adopting the Hebrew surname Meir, Golda replaced Sharet at the foreign ministry, serving as Israel's representative on the international stage. In July 1956, Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser announced the nationalization of the Suez Canal, threatening British and French economic interests. When the British and French invited Israel to join a plot to seize the canal by military force, Ben-Gurion jumped on board, resenting Nasser for closing the canal to Israeli shipping and allowing Palestinian Fedayeen to launch attacks on Israel from Egyptian soil. While Meir was party to the discussions, Moshe Dayan and Shimon Peres from the Ministry of Defense did much of the talking. The three parties developed a plan for Israel to launch an invasion of Egypt while Britain and France would intervene under the pretext of acting as peacekeepers while accomplishing their true intentions of occupying the canal. The operation began on the 29th of October 1956, and within four days, Israeli troops captured the Gaza Strip and the entire Sinai Peninsula to the east of the canal. Though badly beaten, NASA rendered the canal unnavigable by sinking ships and gained international sympathy, while both the Soviets and the Americans urged Israeli forces to withdraw at the United Nations. Foreign Minister Golda Meir represented Israel at the UN, arguing that the Israeli occupation of the Sinai Peninsula was an act of self-defense after the Fedayeen repeatedly attacked Israel from Egyptian bases. Succumbing to diplomatic pressure from the United States, Ben-Gurion agreed to withdraw from the Sinai in return for U.S. recognition of Israel's right to retaliate against further Fedayeen attacks from Egypt. Meir reluctantly gave a speech to the UN to this effect, but was disappointed when the Americans did not acknowledge Israel's right to retaliate. In the aftermath of the Suez Crisis, Meir and Ben-Gurion also had their differences about how to deal with West Germany. While Ben-Gurion sought economic and military support from the Germans, Meir was hesitant about engaging a government which retained many former Nazi officials. Over time, as Germany became Israel's second largest arms supplier, Meir supported Ben-Gurion's policy of seeking closer ties to Germany to the extent that in 1965, she accepted the appointment of former Nazi officer Ralph Friedman Pauls as German ambassador to Israel. In May 1960, Israel's National Security Agency, Mossad, abducted the senior Nazi official Adolf Eichmann from Argentina, where he had fled in 1945 after being found guilty of war crimes. When Argentina complained to the UN that Israel had violated its sovereignty, Meir issued a strong defense of Israeli actions, arguing that the illegal incursion was justified in order to bring perpetrators of the Holocaust to justice. The UN endorsed her argument, and Eichmann was tried and executed in Israel in June 1962. Meir spent much of her tenure as foreign minister developing relations with newly independent states in sub-Saharan Africa. 
While Meir saw black Africans as natural allies in the struggle against colonialism and ethnic discrimination, the African states were glad for the opportunity to receive economic assistance from a country that had not been involved in carving up the continent. Meir helped President Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana establish a state shipping company. Israeli construction companies managed a public works program in Nigeria. And after the Belgians left the Congo in 1962, she provided Israeli army doctors to address the shortage of physicians. While Ben-Gurion was skeptical of his foreign minister's outreach in Africa, Meir justified her efforts as a means to counter Arab influence in the region. Meir's interest in Africa was also prompted by a sense that Ben-Gurion saw diplomacy primarily as a means to acquire weapons and relied on officials in the defense ministry, which he ran himself, to guide his relations with the world's leading powers. Not only did Meir consider the likes of Dayan and Perez needlessly belligerent, she feared that they would turn away from the dominant Labour Zionist ideology. When Ben-Gurion attempted to elevate Dayan and Perez to the cabinet in the late 1950s, Meir resisted alongside two veteran Mapai leaders, Minister of Education Zalman Aran and Minister of Trade Finis Sapir. A long and tortuous struggle ensued between Ben-Gurion and the old guard led by Meir during the first half of the 1960s. Ben-Gurion sought to open a public inquiry into the conduct of Fina Slavon, who served as Minister of Defence from 1954 to 1955. Levon had been accused of authorising a false flag operation to bomb various civilian targets in Egypt, but denied any knowledge and blamed Perez as the man responsible. After being forced to resign, Lavon sought to clear his name. When Ben-Gurion proposed a full judicial inquiry, Meir and most of the Mapai leaders protested, horrified at the prospect of a leadership struggle being played out in public. Ben-Gurion resigned from the premiership in June 1963 and was replaced by Levi Eshkol, but continued to call for a public investigation into the Lavon affair, attacking his successor in the process. Despite being in her mid-sixties and having recently been diagnosed with lymphoma, Meir led the campaign to prevent Ben-Gurion from making a political comeback. When a dying Moshe Sharet attacked Ben-Gurion for undermining national unity in the Knesset in February 1965, Meir leaned over and kissed him before launching her own assault on the former Prime Minister. Ben-Gurion responded by forming a new party, Rafi, which won 10 seats in the Knesset elections in November. In the meantime, Meir had organized an alliance with the pro-Soviet incarnation of Ardut Ha Voida, which had split from Mapai in 1944, which won 45 seats in total, hammering the final nail into Ben-Gurion's political coffin. Following her political victory, Meir resigned as foreign minister in January 1966 and declared her intention to retire due to illness. She retained considerable political clout and within weeks was asked to serve as secretary general of Mapai, a role she accepted in order to seek the unification of the moderate socialist parties into a single united Labour Party. Although Eshkol was prime minister in name, Meir was the most powerful political leader in the country. While the Israeli government attempted to recover from the destructive political struggles of the previous decade, tensions were increasing on the Egyptian-Israeli border. On the 16th of May 1967, in response to false Soviet intelligence of an imminent Israeli attack, Nasser requested the withdrawal of the UN peacekeeping force on the Egyptian-Israeli border, which had been in place since the Suez Crisis, intending to replace them with Egyptian soldiers. Eshko's government struggled to deal with the crisis, while Conservative opposition leader Menachem Begin joined forces with Dayan 
calling for Ben-Gurion to lead a government of national unity. Eshkol and Meir resisted these moves, but were forced to acquiesce to a national unity government with Dayan as Minister of Defense. On the morning of the 5th of June, Dayan ordered the Israeli Air Force to take to the skies, and within a matter of hours, over 300 Egyptian planes were destroyed on the ground. Over the course of six days, Israeli troops reoccupied the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula and conquered the Golan Heights from Egypt's ally Syria, while East Jerusalem and the West Bank were seized from Jordan. This time, the Israelis were determined to resist UN calls to withdraw their occupation forces. Back in Israel, Meir continued her efforts to unite the moderate left, resulting in the creation of the Israeli Labour Party in January 1968, following the merger of Mapai, Rafi and Adut. After serving as the first General Secretary of the United Party, Meir stepped down in August 1968, seemingly intent on retiring for good. In order to undermine Dayan's ambitions to become Eshkol's successor, Meir had installed former Adut leader Yigal Alon as Eshkol's deputy prime minister. With Alon and Dayan arguing in the background over what to do with the West Bank, Eshkol had a heart attack in late 1968 and died at the end of February 1969. Recognizing that the appointment of either Alon or Dayan as Prime Minister would risk a split in the party, Labour Secretary General Pinas Sapir invited Mayer to become the new Prime Minister. Recognizing her failing health, she accepted only after being assured by her doctor that she had another 10 years to live. Although both Dayan and Alon were far more popular among the people, on the 7th of March, the Labour Party's Central Committee voted unanimously in favour of Mayer, who assumed the premiership on the 17th. Two months shy of her 71st birthday, the woman who had been at Ben-Gurion's right hand in the 1950s before plotting his political downfall in the 1960s, had become the first female head of government in the Western world. The Israel Golda Meir inherited was a far cry from the socialist agrarian paradise she had dreamed about as a young girl in Milwaukee. Nevertheless, she could pride herself on her part in building a homeland for the Jewish people. However, it was one that remained under attack from hostile neighbors. In 1968, Following the humiliating defeat in the Six-Day War, NASA launched the War of Attrition by firing missiles from the western bank of the Suez Canal into Israeli-occupied Sinai. As Prime Minister, Meir inherited Eshkol's coalition, which spanned the political spectrum and created political deadlock. Thanks to her modesty and her down-to-earth style, by July, her approval rating soared to 90%, and in October 1969, she led an alliance of Labour and the left-wing MAPAM party, which won 56 seats in the Knesset. Despite her socialist leanings, she struggled to manage the Labour disputes which embroiled the country. Although the Israeli economy would grow by 35% from 1969 to 1973, workers' wages did not keep up with inflation, while all the labor unions in the country were run by the state through Histadrut, Meir was unwilling to grant the Histadrut any degree of independence from the state, and the Labor Federation collapsed within a decade. Her fidelity to socialist concepts of collectivism undermined her support among the younger liberal individualist section of society. In March 1971, Meir faced a popular uprising in Jerusalem organized by the Black Panthers, an organization which took its name from the American Civil Rights Group to protest against discrimination against Jews from North Africa and the Middle East who experienced a lower standard of living than those with Eastern European ancestry. The Panthers resented the fact that the Israeli government was dominated by Eastern European Jews 
and Mayer herself had once said that Jews who didn't speak Yiddish were not real Jews. While cracking down on the Panthers, Meyer attempted to defend Eastern European Jews by claiming that they had faced more deprivation and discrimination than other Jews and accused the Panthers of being unpatriotic. The demonstrations continued into the summer, during which the Panthers demanded Meyer's resignation and burned her effigy. Despite her previous opposition to Ben-Gurion on the same issue, Mayer now argued that defense spending was a priority and the government could not afford social improvements. In spite of the Israeli military's record of success, Mayer was anxious about Israel's continued survival, especially after the Palestinian Liberation Organization's leader Yasser Arafat, who had assumed the place of the ailing Nasser as the leader of the Arab cause in 1970, announced that the Arabs sought the destruction of the State of Israel. Though Meir attempted to find a diplomatic solution with her Arab neighbors, they refused to open talks without the Israelis first withdrawing to their pre-1967 borders. Unsurprisingly, Meir refused to give up her bargaining chips before negotiations had even begun. Disillusioned by the UN peace process, the Americans and Soviets attempted to come up with a solution for the Middle East. Neither of the great powers wanted the Cold War to turn hot, and US President Richard Nixon was keen to improve relations with the Soviets. Mayer believed that such peace initiatives could not achieve much, while the Arabs remained determined to wipe Israel off the world map. In December 1969, Nixon's Secretary of State, William Rogers, announced a peace plan based on Israeli withdrawal from all occupied territories in return for an Egyptian promise of non-belligerency. Mayer objected to Rogers' vague proposals and instructed her ambassador to Washington to mobilize the American Jewish lobby against it. The Israeli refusal was accompanied by bombing raids into the Egyptian interior leading the Soviets to increase their arms supplies to Egypt. At the end of July 1970, Meir reluctantly agreed to Rogers' offer of a 90-day ceasefire alongside UN mediation, but her trust in the Americans was undermined when Israeli intelligence discovered that NASA had used the ceasefire to move a Soviet anti-aircraft missile system into place on the western bank of the Suez Canal. When pressured to demonstrate greater flexibility, the Israeli Prime Minister routinely brought up the anxiety she experienced as a young child faced with the threat of pogroms in the Russian Empire, accusing the Americans in particular of sacrificing Jewish security for their diplomatic ends. As she took her defiant stand, she drew closer to her defense minister and erstwhile rival Moshe Dayan. The prime minister acknowledged her ignorance of military affairs and relied on advice from the popular general, while the defense minister respected the political abilities of Israel's matriarch. The death of Nasser in September 1970 raised hopes of a peace settlement with his successor, Anwar Sadat. Although Sadat continued to insist on Israeli withdrawal from all the occupied territories, Meir offered a partial withdrawal from the eastern bank of the Suez Canal. Though Sadat's counter-offer was unacceptable, Meir sketched out a plan which would see Israel keep the Golan Heights, Jerusalem, and the Egyptian port of Sharm el-Sheikh on the southern tip of the Sinai, while Israeli troops would withdraw from the rest of the peninsula. The proposals prompted Menachem Begin to call a vote of no confidence against her, which she survived by the narrowest of margins. Mayer's plans for the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were less well-defined, but she was prepared to give up these territories to the Arabs, preferably Jordan, since she believed that Israel's security was best served with a Jewish majority state rather than incorporating more than one million Arabs from the occupied territories. 
Unwilling to upset the delicate political balance in the country before the Arabs were serious about negotiations, Meir maintained the status quo, leaving Dayan and the Ministry of Defense to govern the West Bank. Dayan favored the unorthodox solution of a permanent Israeli military presence in the West Bank while allowing the Arab areas to be administered by Jordan. Although opposed by most of his government colleagues, Dayan hoped that coexistence would lead to peace and began to implement his vision, building Jewish settlements in the West Bank and facilitating the movement of goods and people between Israel and Jordan. Despite joining the Egyptians in the 1967 war, the Jordanians remained Israel's best friend among the Arab states. The Israelis recognized that King Hussein had been under considerable pressure to demonstrate pan-Arab solidarity from fellow Arab leaders and his own Palestinian subjects. Hussein was also keen to avoid the fate of his grandfather King Abdullah, whom Meir had met on the eve of Israeli independence and who had been assassinated by a Palestinian terrorist in 1951. On the 6th of September 1970, Palestinian terrorists hijacked four commercial planes and landed them on Dawson's Field, a Jordanian airbase calling for the release of Fedayeen prisoners. After releasing most of the hostages, the Palestinians kept the Jews in custody and blew up the empty planes on the 12th of September. Jordan descended into civil war on the 17th of September when Hussein ordered loyal troops to crush the Fedayeen in his capital of Amman, resulting in Syrian intervention on behalf of the Palestinians. After receiving a plea for help from Hussein, Meir ordered the Israeli Air Force to fly over the Syrian columns in a demonstration of force, which, combined with a successful Jordanian counterattack, halted the Syrian attack. A tentative peace was brokered between Jordan and Palestine by Nasser days before his death. As the stalemate in the Middle East continued, a host of parties offered to mediate a peace settlement including a delegation of African leaders, Romania's communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, and Pope Paul VI. Meir had given up hope of any meaningful peace with the Arabs, and this belief was reinforced on the morning of the 5th of September 1972, when the Palestinian terrorist group Black September kidnapped 11 Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics. With two Israelis already dead, the terrorists threatened to kill the rest unless Israel released over 200 Arab prisoners. The incident was the latest in a series of terrorist attacks against Israeli targets authorized by Arafat's Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO. When the terrorists refused to accept a ransom payment from the West German authorities, German police launched a botched rescue mission which resulted in the deaths of all the Israelis, a German police officer, and five terrorists. In response, on the 15th of September, Meir authorized Mossad to launch an operation to hunt down the terrorists responsible for Munich. When Meir was criticized for depriving the Palestinians of the right to their own nation, she refused to acknowledge the existence of a separate Palestinian nation and argued that Palestinian Arabs were free to settle in any of the Arab states in the Middle East. In May 1973, after four years leading the country, Meir announced her intention to step aside from the premiership in October. Her approval ratings remained above 70%, the economy was growing rapidly, and Israel was receiving generous military aid from the U.S. government, which allowed her to feel increasingly secure. While Meir was turning her attention away from defense and towards social policy, in August, the Syrians installed Soviet anti-aircraft batteries opposite the Golan Heights. On the 25th of September, King Hussein secretly visited Israel to warn of an imminent Syrian attack supported by Egypt. Despite Israeli intelligence reports that Egyptian forces were advancing towards the Suez Canal, 
Dayan believed that the Egyptians would not dare to challenge the Israeli military. On the 5th of October, the Israeli Defense Forces Chief of Staff, General David Al-Azhar, suspected that hostilities were imminent, but the Israeli leadership refrained from full-scale mobilization. On the morning of the 6th of October, the day of Yom Kippur, the most important holiday on the Jewish religious calendar, Meir met with Al-Azhar and Dayan. Although she decided against launching a preemptive airstrike, which would jeopardize American diplomatic support, she agreed to full mobilization over Dayan's objections. The invasion began that afternoon, but the Israeli leadership was confident that they would repeat their previous successes against the Arabs. They were surprised to hear reports of Egyptians launching coordinated strikes on Israeli targets along the canal in the south, while Syrian tanks rolled towards the Golan Heights. The Israeli air superiority, which had won the Six-Day War, was nullified by the Egyptian and Syrian anti-aircraft systems. While a panicked Dayan proposed giving up the Golan for a more defensible position, Elazar remained optimistic that he could hold off the enemy attacks long enough to mobilize his reserves. When a disheartened Dayan offered his resignation, Meir refused, but took personal charge of the war effort, developing plans for a counter-offensive alongside her senior officers. As the Israeli reserves took to the field, the tide of war began to turn at the cost of heavy casualties. By the third day of the war, the Syrians were falling back in the north, while Al-Azhar's costly counterattack in the south altered the Egyptian advance. After recapturing the Golan Heights, Meir authorized the Israeli Defense Force to advance on the Syrian capital of Damascus on the 11th of October. On the 14th of October, Israeli tanks defeated an Egyptian attack in the Sinai, allowing Israeli troops to cross over the canal on the 15th. When the Soviets and Americans proposed a ceasefire and direct negotiations between Egypt and Israel, Meir was initially inclined to reject the terms since the Israeli Defense Force was poised to surround and eliminate the Egyptian Third Army on the Sinai. After learning that Sadat had accepted the proposals, Meir met U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to finalize the details of a ceasefire on the 22nd of October. After an Egyptian attempt to break out of the encirclement, fighting resumed until a second ceasefire was agreed on the 25th of October with the Egyptian Third Army completely trapped. While the Israelis had managed to pull off a victory, 2,600 soldiers had perished in the process, and rather than celebrating, the Israeli people blamed the initial setbacks on Meir and Dayan. Though she acknowledged her responsibility for the debacle, Meir went to America to discuss peace proposals with Kissinger and Nixon. In late-night discussions with Kissinger, Meir adamantly refused to break the encirclement of the Third Army without a prisoner exchange. In the meantime, on the 28th of October, Egyptian and Israeli army officers made good progress in negotiating a prisoner exchange and the resupply of the Egyptian Third Army, as well as the gradual withdrawal of troops from both sides and the reopening of the Suez Canal. The agreement was finalized when Kissinger visited the Middle East the following week. As a result of the war, the Knesset elections scheduled for the 31st of October had been postponed to the 31st of December. Despite her previous commitment to resign, Mayor hoped to hold the Labour Party together while denying power to Begin's Likud party. While Dayan had been blamed for the failure to prepare for the war, Meir kept her defence minister in his post, causing her own popularity to decline. On the 21st of December, Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Iban attended the Middle East Peace Conference in Geneva alongside the Jordanian and Egyptian delegations, but the meeting lasted one day 
without being reconvened. When voters went to the polls on the 31st, Mayor's Labour won 40% of the vote against 29 for Likud. While Labour remained the largest party, Mayor was disappointed that she had lost support. As she attempted to cobble together a new government, Mayor realized that whether she retained Dayan or sacked him, a faction of the Labour Party would refuse to support the government. On the 11th of April, she resigned as party leader, throwing her support behind Yitzhak Rabin, who narrowly emerged as the party's choice. Mayer retained the premiership until she was able to secure a disengagement agreement with Syria, brokered by Kissinger on the 31st of May. On the 3rd of June, she left the Prime Minister's office and was succeeded by Rabin. At the age of 76, Golda Meir was a legend in her own lifetime. When her ghost-written autobiography was published in 1975, it became a global bestseller. On the 14th of November 1977, Meir attended the opening of Golda, a Broadway play by William Gibson, only to be thoroughly disappointed by Anne Bancroft's performance in the title role. Days later, she returned to Israel to meet Anwar Sadat, who was visiting Israel after declaring his willingness to make peace. When Meir asked the Egyptian president why he could not have met her several years earlier, Sadat replied that the time was not right. Earlier in the year, Menachem Begin had become prime minister after defeating Labour in the Knesset elections in May. Mayer was disappointed that the conservative Begin, who appointed the rehabilitated Dayan as his foreign minister, was taking the credit for making peace. In September 1978, Begin, Sadat and US President Jimmy Carter negotiated the Camp David Accords, paving the way for Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories. While Begin and Sadat were in Oslo to receive the 1978 Nobel Peace Prize, Golda Meir died of lymphoma at the age of 80 on the 8th of December 1978. Golda Meir had lived an extraordinary life spanning three continents. After being born into poverty in the Russian Empire with the threat of pogroms hanging over her, she spent her formative years in the United States, where she became a passionate believer in the Labour Zionist movement. After struggling to balance her life ambitions with her parents' demands, she prevailed upon her reluctant husband to move to Palestine, anticipating the establishment of a Jewish state following the Balfour Declaration. After a difficult first decade in the kibbutz and struggling to make ends meet in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, Meir began her gradual climb up the ranks of the Jewish political leadership, becoming an invaluable advocate for the Zionist movement in the United States, neglecting her children and leaving her husband in the process. After working tirelessly to assist European Jews who fell under Nazi occupation in the 1930s and 40s, Meir emerged as the right-hand woman of David Ben-Gurion, the father of the State of Israel, founded in 1948. When Israel survived the Arab invasion that year, Meir was instrumental in raising funds to enable the Israeli military to continue the resistance. As Minister of Labour in the early 1950s, she championed ambitious housing, construction and social welfare programs before being appointed foreign minister on the eve of the Suez Crisis. Serving almost a decade as foreign minister, she helped to continue the flow of military aid from the United States while strengthening relations with African states. After toppling Ben-Gurion in the mid-1960s, Meir united the labor movement and wielded power behind the scenes during the Six-Day War in 1967 before her appointment as Prime Minister in 1969 following Levi Eshkol's death. Though Meir spent much of her premiership seeking a peace agreement with Nasser and his successor Sadat, 
she was caught off guard by the Yom Kippur War in 1973 and struggled to manage its consequences despite successfully organizing successful counteroffensives against Egypt and Syria. It was only during the final months of her life in 1978 that her rivals, Begin and Sadat, made a significant step in the Middle East peace process. However, the issue remains unresolved still in the 21st century. What do you think of Golda Meir? Was she a formidable leader who demonstrated to the world that women could stand up to men on the international political stage and ensured the continued survival of the State of Israel? Or did she miss several opportunities to make peace with the Arabs as a result of her intransigence and lack of flexibility? Please, let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Muamma Gaddafi was born Muamma Muhammad Abu Minya al Gaddafi. He was born most likely sometime in 1941, though some scholars suggest he was born in the 1930s or in 1943 to a Bedouin family in the Kadhafa tribe that claimed descent from the Prophet Muhammad near the desert village of Kasar Buhadi, south of the city of Sirta in the western deserts of Libya. His father, Muhammad Abdul Salam bin Hamid bin Muhammad, simply known as Abu Minya, was a subsistence goat and camel herder. His mother was named Aisha bin Nihran. Both were Arab descendants and were part of the rural poor communities that made up the majority of Italian Libya. Gaddafi was born in a land that had for millennia been occupied by various invaders. He later wrote that men from his tribe feared the sea, refusing to go near it because of the legacy of seaborne invaders. The most recent invasions had occurred following the decline of the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century. Libya, then known as Tripoli, had long been a semi-autonomous region of the Ottoman Empire, at times functioning more as an independent state than a part of the Turkish-led empire. This independence came under threat in 1902 when European powers divided Africa into spheres of influence. In their discussions, European leaders concluded that Italy had a legitimate claim to the territory known as Libya. Italians saw Libya as rightfully their own, claiming ownership based on their descent from the Romans who had previously conquered the territory over a thousand years earlier. As Italian interest in conquering Libya grew, the territory was racked by divisions as the Young Turk Revolution rocked the Ottoman Empire. The Young Turk Revolution was a series of constitutional reforms forced by Turkish nationalists beginning in 1908. The divided elites across the empire, even in far-off provinces such as Libya, where supporters of the revolutionaries sought to oust political appointees of the Ottoman Sultan. In the chaos following the revolution, many Libyans threw their support behind the invading Italians who in September of 1911 launched a major invasion of Libya. The Italians soon seized many coastal cities. However, they were unable to penetrate deeper into the hinterlands of Libya, leading to a long and bloody war between supporters of the Ottoman Empire and the Italian forces and their allies. Increasingly, however, as the Ottoman Empire found itself embroiled in World War I, the Libyans were forced to fend for themselves helping to further fracture the Libyan resistance into smaller, bickering factions. Fighting and protracted negotiations lasted between the Libyans and Italians until 1923, when Benito Mussolini, the new fascist leader of Italy, launched an all-out invasion of the territory. By 1926, over 20,000 Italian troops were stationed in Libya, and the dictator used all available means, including modern weaponry, such as tanks, airplanes and poison gas. Gaddafi's father fought against these invaders, along with thousands of other Libyans. However, their efforts were largely unsuccessful. Not only did the Italians bring modern weaponry to bear against the people of Libya, 
but they also created concentration camps that held likely over 100,000 Libyans, or two-thirds of the population. Perhaps as many as 70,000 people died in these camps. The Italians also engaged in all-out warfare, destroying local wells and killing livestock in order to subdue resistance fighters. They even constructed a tall, four-meter-thick barbed wire fence from the city of Bardia to the town of Jagbub in an effort to halt supplies flowing in from British-occupied Egypt. As Italians gained control of larger swathes of Libya, officials encouraged large numbers of immigrants from the Italian mainland to migrate to the newly conquered territory, particularly as Mussolini's policies of vast public works began coming to Libya. Roads, new settlements and other modern conveniences were all part of the Italian government's efforts to increase the European presence in Libya. However, they also actively discouraged local political participation, instead favoring an Italian-controlled government that frequently clashed with local Libyan tribes. The Italians furthermore sought to suppress all Libyan literature in an effort to force Libyans to become more like their colonizers. Throughout this period, many Libyans continued to favor pan-Islamic governments, or those governments that united various nationalities under the common belief system of Islam. However, a growing portion of the Libyan population, particularly the younger generation that came of age following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1918 and the Italian occupation, came to favor Arab nationalism or the belief in a nation-state based on Arab ethnicity rather than based on religion. The first efforts at creating an independent nation-state of Libya were in November of 1918, when the Tripoli Republic was formed and declared its independence both from Ottoman and European powers. However, no recognition came from European powers, particularly since the British in 1915 had promised the Italians control of Libya in order to gain their support during the Great War. The results were Italian occupation and oppression of local political activity. Fleeing from the oppression, many Libyan exiles in the 1920s and 1930s conducted a fiery, if ineffective, war of words against the Italians, helping to develop a strong Libyan nationalist movement that would later impact Gaddafi. During World War II, few Libyans were willing to support either the Allies or the Axis. Both sides contained former enemies, the Allies having both the British and French who had allowed Italy to conquer Libya, and the Axis having Italy. Libyans provided the Allies some assistance in exchange for promises of independence following the war. However, trust in European promises was never very strong among many of the Libyan community. Following the war, Libya was divided into spheres of control by the British and French. Gaddafi as a child perhaps even saw some of the soldiers of these two Allied powers. Over the next 10 years, British, French, Italian and American negotiators continued to debate the future of the Italian colony. Italian and British officials initially favored a return of the colony to a divided colonial status. However, these plans failed when they were opposed by the other parties. Though Libyan politics remained divided by region, with some favoring a division of Libya into three separate nations, a growing outcry for independence was recognized by the United Nations General Assembly on the 21st of November, 1949, after extended and serious debate, the delegates called for Libya to become an independent and sovereign state no later than the 1st of January 1952. Following the appointment of a commission comprised of international and Libyan delegates, progress towards independence was rapid, with the Libyan National Assembly on the 7th of October 1951 approving the formation of a constitutional, hereditary monarchy built within the framework of a federal system. King Idris I, who was previously known as Muhammad Idris al-Maldi al-Sanusi, was chosen as the first monarch of Libya and Islam was declared the state religion. During this period, Libya remained a solid ally of the West, providing a stable ally for Western powers concerned with the expanding Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Though initially hampered by crippling poverty and disunion, gradually the Libyan state seemed to be headed towards greater prosperity, as deals with Italy and the discovery of oil in 1959 provided King Idris greater economic security. 
However, rather than liberalize with the expanding economy, King Idris tightened his control of the state, fighting back against efforts to generate political and social reform. Many Libyans were angered that much of the surplus profit generated by oil went to Westerners' pockets, despite the fact that Western companies provided the bulk of the investment to power oil development. Oil revenues also increased wealth disparities between Libyans, which further frustrated many young Libyans who viewed their government as outdated and in the pockets of Western powers. Throughout the 1960s, these tensions between the king's government and the people only heightened, leaving many to seek a new solution to the corruption of the king's officials. These problems were further inflamed by the spread of pan-Arab nationalism, an ideology based on the idea that Arabs could regain their former glory if they united across the region against outsiders. This belief system gained greater following, particularly among young Arabs across North Africa and the Middle East, especially following the humiliation of Arab armies by Israeli forces during the Six-Day War, fought between the 5th of June and the 10th of June 1967. Many Arabs were furious at the West's response to Israel's victory. Each of these factors helped to create the perfect storm necessary for a revolution. As he tended his family's herds, Gaddafi watched as his beloved people seemed to succumb to Western influence and local corruption. Gaddafi first received his education at a local Muslim elementary school, where legend tells that he was looked down on for his Bedouin roots. He supposedly slept in the local mosque at night on school days and returned to his family on the weekends, where he primarily lived with his mother and three sisters. His father, now a merchant, was often traveling and gone from home. Gaddafi was fiercely proud of his people and his Muslim Arab heritage. He likely was angered by the stories his father and others told about the atrocities committed by the Italians and other Westerners during the World War period. He perhaps mourned when the State of Israel was successfully created in 1948, signifying the loss of Palestine as an Arab state. Despite all the defeats suffered by the Arabs, one bright star seemed to shine in the Arab world. Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser, the new president of Egypt, who had organized a coup to overthrow the Egyptian King Farouk in 1952, when Gaddafi was around 10 years old. Gaddafi became an avid listener of the radio program, The Voice of the Arabs, a show that originated from Cairo, Egypt, that supported the Nasser regime. By his teenage years, Gaddafi had found his hero in Nasser. Nasser's efforts to expel Western influence in Egypt, socialize the nation, and unite Arabs across the Middle East and North Africa was thrilling to the young disciple of Libya. According to Gaddafi himself, it was during these years that he first began to envision himself changing his nation and becoming a hero like Nasser, even though he was a lowly schoolboy in the rural west of Libya. Gaddafi organized local student protests during the 1956 Suez Crisis, also known as the Second Arab-Israeli War, or the tripartite aggression in many Arab households, which began in late 1956 when Israel, the United Kingdom, and France invaded Egypt in an effort to capture the Suez Canal and overthrow Nasser, who had recently nationalized the canal, which had been owned by foreign powers. Israel sought primarily to end Nasser's blockade of their port in the Straits of Tehran. The invasion was a failure for the Europeans and only strengthened Nasser's reputation and his prestige in the minds of many young Arabs, such as the 15-year-old Gaddafi. It also enraged many Libyans and violent protests broke out across the country after Libyans learned that British officials had considered using its bases in Libya to attack Egypt. Gaddafi likely applauded the riots and protests, believing that the nation was disentangling itself from the hold of Western powers. Gaddafi was seen as a leader among his peers and was known for his powerful personality. Many of his classmates, like himself, desired to free Libya by eventually toppling King Idris. As a teenager, Gaddafi enrolled at Sabha High School in Fezzan, Kadhafi. There, he and his friends formed what they called a Central Committee and held secret meetings to discuss the political ideas of President Nasser and perhaps other leading Arab thinkers, while also plotting to overthrow the Libyan monarchy. As his movement expanded, 
he divided his followers into cells of revolutionary operatives. While still lacking much of the structure of a truly revolutionary movement, Gaddafi was showing promise as a leader of Libyan Arab nationalists. As he worked to create his movement, Gaddafi increasingly came to dislike teachers and intellectuals, believing such people to have an enormous self-regard and believed that they frequently misguided their students. Gaddafi often later in life singled out teachers for criticism in his speeches, perhaps reflecting the experiences of his youth. In 1961, Gaddafi was expelled from his school for leading a student protest against Syria withdrawing from the United Arab Republic, which it had established with Egypt in 1958. At the protest in the town center of Sebha, Gaddafi praised Nasser and condemned British and American military bases in Libya. His speech not only got him expelled, but also banned from studying in his home province. Leaving his home and family, Gaddafi traveled north to Misrata, over 700 kilometers north, to finish his studies, which he did in 1961. Undeterred by his expulsion from his home province, Gaddafi set about expanding his network of revolutionaries while finishing his education. His recruitment efforts expanded beyond Misrata, and Gaddafi found recruits in Tripoli, Janzur, Jletin, and Homs, allowing him to create an even broader network of revolutionary cells throughout the country. While building his network, Gaddafi briefly studied history at the University of Tripoli. However, more momentous was a gathering of his followers in 1963. Members of the cells from Sabha, Misrata and Tripoli, and likely other cities, gathered to discuss future plans for the movement. At this meeting, the organizers and participants decided that Gaddafi and two others from the movement would enroll at the Benghazi Military Academy, though some suggest the idea originated from Gaddafi alone. Their purpose in enlisting in the army was to begin recruiting supporters for a coup among the army. Gaddafi later recalled, the army was the only thing capable of imposing the people's will by force. Gaddafi soon insisted that others in his movement enlist as well, and though some of his fellow revolutionaries were less enthusiastic about enlisting in the army, Gaddafi's orders were to be followed to the letter. As Gaddafi entered the army, he reorganized his movement to directly resemble that of Nasser's Egyptian revolutionaries, Gaddafi renaming it the Free Unionist Officers' Movement and creating another central committee to direct the movement. Some of his boyhood friends were key members of Gaddafi's inner circle as he rose to power. Some of these men were Ali al-Khudri, Abdel Salem Jaloud, Mustafa al-Kharoubi, and Abu Bakr Yunis Jabir all who later held prestigious positions within Gaddafi's government. Frequently, Gaddafi was punished for his rebellion against officers and the military structure. Yet, the young man continued to defy the system he hated. Meetings of the revolutionaries were held during holidays and in secret locations throughout Libya. Members of the movement continued to recruit enthusiastically, seeking to gain broad support, particularly in the military necessary to execute a successful coup. They also gathered military supplies and hid them throughout Libya. While in the academy, Gaddafi demonstrated a brutal and sinister aspect to his leadership. When a cadet committed a sexual offense, under the direction of Gaddafi, the young cadet had his hands and feet bound and was dragged to a firing location, where Gaddafi and his associates proceeded to shoot the young man without killing him until an officer arrived to finish the job at which Gaddafi and his fellow officers simply laughed. Gaddafi himself graduated from the academy in 1965. During his training, Gaddafi briefly traveled for further education to Turkey and the United Kingdom, where he learned advanced communications techniques. While in England, Gaddafi mocked the British and everything the West stood for, which he saw as corruption and conquest. From 1965 to 1969, recruits steadily poured into Gaddafi's movement, as did stolen government ammunition and supplies. By early 1969, Gaddafi was done with dreaming about revolution. He was ready to enact it. He and his inner circle believed they had enough support throughout the Libyan military structure to successfully stage the dreamed-of coup. Multiple coup dates were planned, however each time events arose that necessitated it being pushed further back. 
loyal military leadership had also heard rumors of a potential plot, and Gaddafi himself was questioned multiple times and placed under surveillance. Many times, Gaddafi and his fellow leaders were nearly captured during secret rendezvous. Perhaps it was youthfulness and the lack of tight control that spared the movement from a quick suppression by military authorities. Leading military officials later recalled that they were fairly certain Gaddafi and his followers were plotting a coup. However, they believed it a pipe dream that could never be accomplished. How wrong those officials proved to be when, on the 1st of September 1969, Gaddafi and his followers launched their revolution. Gaddafi was tense during the start of the coup, but he depended on his faith in Allah, who he believed was on his side. Gaddafi recalled that a radio broadcast from Egypt had included the Quranic line, Allah will not deny the faithful their reward. Gaddafi saw this verse as a sign and trusted that at 2.30 a.m., the prearranged hour of the coup, he and his co-conspirators would successfully establish a true Arab government that would no longer bow to Western nations. At the pre-signaled hour, Gaddafi and his followers worked to control radio stations and other communication networks essential for the government. Mistakes were made throughout the process, conspirators not arriving at the correct destination, officials escaping arrest, and countless other problems plagued the coup. However, the Libyan government, so divided and powerless, collapsed in the face of the determined conspirators. King Idris, who was away from the palace, turned to the British for aid. However, British officials had little stomach for any intervention in the Middle East. The monarchy had fallen quickly, and Gaddafi and his followers now wielded absolute control of the state. Libyans awoke on the 1st of September 1969 to the voice of Gaddafi on their radio sets. He spoke rousingly, declaring that Libya is a free, self-governing republic. She will advance on the road to freedom, the path of unity and social justice. With God's help, prosperity and equality will be seen to rule us all. Over the next few weeks, Gaddafi and his circle worked to present themselves to the people as ideal rulers. Gaddafi built his support of a group of educated middle-class Libyans who had rapidly accepted ideas of pan-Arab nationalism. Many had been taught by nationalistic teachers from Egypt, Palestine and Sudan who had been brought up to staff Libya's schools prior to the coup. Many had also done what Gaddafi did as a teenager and listened to radio broadcasts emanating from groups across the Middle East who advocated for a shift towards an Arab unity. Furthermore, other Libyans had traveled to Egyptian and Iraqi universities, where the success of nationalist leaders had transformed those nations. Many Libyans were excited at the youth, the lowly origins and charisma of the new revolutionary leaders. Despite the excitement of some Libyans, others were concerned that the cadre of revolutionaries had seemingly sprung out of nowhere and seemed to have no experience in the realm of global politics. Gaddafi and his band of revolutionaries understood that they needed to act quickly to ensure their movement's survival. To ensure their success, Gaddafi reached out to Egypt. President Nasser, shocked like many other leaders across the globe, sent his chief advisor to see what had occurred in Libya. Later, Nasser himself met Gaddafi and was amazed at how rustic the revolutionaries were. Truly, it had been a revolution that surprised even the most dedicated pan-Arabist. Despite his surprise, Nasser sent a host of advisors and military officers to help stave off a counter-revolution. As Egyptian advisors arrived, Gaddafi and his inner circle worked quickly to radically alter the political structure of the nation and destroy the last vestiges of royal authority. He and his friends arrested hundreds of individuals, including royal family members, politicians, government officials, and army officers who posed the least threat. At the time, the punishments imposed on these opponents was light, though Gaddafi and his revolutionaries humiliated their adversaries by holding public trials that were televised across the nation. Furthermore, Gaddafi helped to break Libyan tribal leaders' hold on politics by redrawing administrative borders to intentionally break up traditional tribal boundaries and by replacing city officials with his own supporters. The Islamic University at al Baida a place of opposition thought, was closed and the army was strengthened. While cracking down on the opposition, Gaddafi moved to strengthen his own position. Taking on the rank of colonel, the same rank Nasser held, 
Gaddafi seized command of the army at the same time that a civilian government was formed. His fellow conspirators, who had been promised that after the coup, the power would be returned to the people, began to recognize that Gaddafi had no intention of giving back his power. Some of the newly appointed civilian leaders attempted to stage another coup in December of 1969 to overthrow Gaddafi. However, they were met with dismal failure. Even some of his close allies were angered by Gaddafi's actions, especially Mohammed Najim, a man who was a strong proponent of democracy. Other revolutionaries were troubled by Gaddafi's public attacks on his fellow conspirators and for his efforts to blame the failures of the revolution on his allies. By and large, however, the majority of Gaddafi's supporters remained awed by their leader and his brilliance in surmounting all odds to overthrow the king and his Western-backed supporters. While some Libyans were terrified at Gaddafi controlling the nation, many were giddy with glee at the attacks on the Western institutions in the country. Foreign military bases were closed and the British were finally expelled in March of 1970, the Americans following a few months later. The last of the Libyan Jewish community was also banished alongside Italian settlers. The property and assets of those who had been expelled were seized by the Gaddafi regime, who declared that it was merely anti-imperialism that prompted the seizures. Foreign banking capital in Libya, as well as oil facilities, were seized, the oil facilities being nationalized for the Libyan state. Gaddafi, always a deeply religious man, also launched a brazen assault against Western cultural influence, attacking and closing casinos and nightclubs, while also banning alcohol in accordance with certain Islamic teachings. In 1972, Sharia law, or Islamic religious law, was established in place of the king's secular system. Gaddafi also established the Islamic Call Society, a Muslim missionary body funded with Libyan oil money that produced propaganda in favor of Islam and Libya. While some Libyans were outraged at the assault on their rights, many others were excited at the restoration of religious authority and the expulsion of the West from Libya. Too many years of imperial aspirations had hardened most Libyans' feelings regarding the West. Westerners were colonizers and conquerors who frequently broke their promises and enabled corruption in local governments. Gaddafi capitalized on these feelings to build up his own power and encourage mass support for his plans. Gaddafi and his closest supporters mobilized the state to ban all political activity not approved by his inner circle, the most dramatic law being Law No. 71. This law, created in 1972, ordered the death penalty to be imposed on any Libyan engaging in party politics, a law which remained in force until Gaddafi's fall in 2011. The revolutionaries also banned unofficial trade unions, the only approved unions being monitored closely by the government's Ministry of Labor. The free press was hamstrung, with 10 major newspapers being closed at the order of the state. Even state-approved presses were rigidly censored to ensure only the state's messages could be disseminated. However, even in the midst of these changes, there was little formal planning on how to reconstruct the nation or stimulate the economy. While authoritarian measures were passed, the economy collapsed and unemployment skyrocketed. Chaos seemed to be descending rapidly on Libya, and many Libyans began to grow distrustful of the young revolutionaries. It was one thing to talk of ideals of Arab nationalism, it was another to make it a reality. Even a once popular government began to lose its appeal when progress seemed stalled. As these crises threatened the nation, Gaddafi began to assert his control over his fellow revolutionaries. More and more of his former allies were offended by the lording manner of Gaddafi and his tyrannical attitudes. A greater number of his allies began to complain about Gaddafi and his frequent childish outbursts in meetings when anyone opposed him. For those who remained loyal, they were incorporated into a new political movement that Gaddafi was gradually organizing to sideline the free unionist officers. Many of the members of the new order included family members and other groups that had not initially participated in the revolution. While he had gained political control, Gaddafi was disappointed that the revolution he wanted to occur in the social fabric of society was not occurring. Many Libyans, while liking his anti-Western and pro-Muslim rhetoric, 
were unwilling to dramatically alter their lives to support Gaddafi's vision of dramatic social change. This led Gaddafi in 1972 to threaten to resign, after which he travelled to Egypt for a brief time. When he returned, his fellow revolutionary leaders informed Gaddafi that they had accepted his resignation. Enraged, Gaddafi reminded the Central Committee that they had not been elected, to which they reminded Gaddafi that he had not either. Infuriated, Gaddafi retorted, I have popular support and I will give my resignation directly to the people. The committee, perhaps sensing a moment to oust their leader, agreed with Gaddafi's proposal and set up a special meeting near Tripoli on the 16th of April 1973 for the people to hear Gaddafi's public resignation. The meeting was to be held in the quiet town of Zawara. On the appointed day, Gaddafi took his place on the stage and as he rose to speak, he shocked all his listeners. Rather than resign, Gaddafi brazenly called for a change to save the revolution and change the laziness of the Libyan people. Gaddafi declared that it was time for a cultural revolution. In launching his new revolution, Gaddafi, in the words of one historian, began an intense personalization of politics that became the staple of Libyan society till 2011. In his program, Gaddafi declared that there would be five major points. First, all existing laws were to be replaced by revolutionary enactments. Second, all anti-revolutionary elements of society were to be suppressed by the state. Third, a revolution would be supported that would destroy the current administrative state and all aspects of bourgeois society. Fourth, the people would be armed in mass to form a large militia to protect the revolution. And finally, the removal of all ideas that contradicted the Quran. In every town, committees were to be formed which would be elected by the people and were to control all aspects of society. Purged from leadership positions were those mayors, school administrators and local leaders who had survived the previous purges. Gaddafi urged his supporters in universities to tear up all the imported books which do not express Arabism, Islam, socialism and progress. By August of 1973, over 2,000 committees had been formed and numerous regime opponents arrested, as well as scores of those accused of sedition by personal rivals on the committees. Rather than slim down the bureaucracy, the government had nearly doubled in size, enabling it to control almost all aspects of social life. While the state apparatus was expanding rapidly, Gaddafi's proposed militia had enlisted over 40,000 new recruits in the first year giving Gaddafi a deadly and loyal band of supporters. Gaddafi was ready to compel the masses to march into revolution with him, regardless of whether they wanted to or not. This societal revolution, and Gaddafi's articulation of it, came to be known as the Third Universal Theory. This theory was first announced to an international conference of Arab and European youth, at which Gaddafi stated his theories would serve all humanity and be based on truth. His theories sought to navigate the political spectrum between communism and capitalism and was, in Gaddafi's view, to be a new middle way. Gaddafi argued that capitalism had turned societies into a circus that had been handed over to the individual without any restraints, while communism turned humans into mere sheep controlled by the government. Gaddafi argued that his theories would work best for the countries deemed to be the third world and could help those nations have the best chance of fighting back against stronger and more oppressive nations. Gaddafi's ideas were deeply tied to his Islamic faith, and the prevailing assumption of the third universal theory was that in order to succeed, humanity had to return to the kingdom of God. However, Gaddafi's theory largely was socialism, with a heavy dose of Islam added to the mix, and Gaddafi was confident that his new invention was the only way for the third world to resist imperialism and the pull of capitalism and communism. While his followers praised it, the theory drew significant criticism for its lack of originality and its confused nature. Gaddafi later articulated his ideas even further in his work entitled The Green Book, a three-part series first published in 1975, which articulated Gaddafi's ideas of how to construct a better world in politics, economics and in social issues. The book argued that in order for society to have a true democracy, it must be stateless. 
Gaddafi believed that parliaments and parties obstructed the progress of people and created division. Instead, Gaddafi suggested the best approach was to have a government made of small committees, in which every citizen participated, something he believed Libya was achieving. He also argued that wages should be abolished, and anything that could possibly exploit another human to be expressly forbidden. In The Green Book, Gaddafi also stated his views on society, promoting the family as the core foundation of a utopian world. He also argued against discrimination of women, but also asserted men and women had differing roles, with the woman primarily responsible for children. The Green Book received criticism as well, yet the theory worked for Gaddafi, in that it provided him and his supporters with an articulation of the convoluted revolution they were enacting in Libya. Gaddafi believed his political theories to be something akin to a new gospel for the modern age and the masses. While some viewed his views as confusing, others celebrated this young man heading a revolution that promised to free an Islamic state from the grasp of Western powers. Gaddafi gave speaking tours in other Arabic states and spread the message of his revolution to any and all who would listen. From the popularity he received, some believed that Gaddafi had let the praise go to his head, leading him to believe that he was the leader of not just Libya, but also the Islamic world. Some of his fellow revolutionaries grew more frustrated at Gaddafi's arrogance. A few resigned and refused to support the new government. Some former friends went to more extreme measures, such as attempting a coup in 1975, which like the previous attempted coup, failed dramatically as it was discovered before it had even begun. Gaddafi was firmly in power and rebellion would not be tolerated in the least. On the 2nd of March 1977 in Sebha, Libya, Gaddafi announced the declaration of the establishment of the authority of the people, which marked the beginning of the Jamahiriya, or State of the Masses. This announcement created, at least in theory, the state envisioned by Gaddafi in his Green Book, in conjunction with the monumental event, Gaddafi renamed Libya the Socialist People's Libyan Arab Jamahiriya and changed the flag to be a plain green flag. Fidel Castro, the Cuban dictator, was invited to be the special guest of honor during the ceremonies. Castro praised the Libyans and crowds filled the streets celebrating the start of a new era in Libya. Despite all his talk of allowing the people to lead, Gaddafi continued to remain at the head of the state. As the thousands of local committees began to function, problems quickly arose. Lack of participation by the majority of Libyans and ambiguity over what the responsibilities even were of the local governments resulted in chaos. Furthermore, the government confiscated all private lands and only leased to individuals what they needed for their subsistence needs. Corruption was rampant and few had faith in the new system. Furthermore, resistance was growing to Gaddafi's system Students took to the streets in protest, just as Gaddafi had years earlier, but this time to protest against the man who was supposedly the saviour of Libya. A year prior to Gaddafi's transformation of the state into his ideal society, students had been detained and arrested en masse in Tripoli and Benghazi for minor protests. Following the change to the Libyan state in March of 1977, Gaddafi turned even more aggressive against the students by publicly hanging a number of students involved in the protest the year before. The hangings took place on Tripoli's al fateh University campus, with university students being forced to watch as their classmates were killed. But the demonstration of power was not just for those in Tripoli. The events were broadcast throughout the nation, alongside several other public executions of alleged spies and participants in the 1975 attempted coup. April the 7th would remain the day of public executions for the rest of the Gaddafi reign. However, even as Gaddafi demonstrated his willingness to use brutal force to suppress dissidents, he also created ways to heighten his power and protect his revolution. In September 1978, Gaddafi announced to the people that in the future a separation of power would occur between revolutionary authority and the people's authority. In March of 1979, Gaddafi and his remaining members of the original Central Committee resigned from their government positions to devote themselves to maintaining the revolutionary spirit of 1969. Gaddafi retained his role as commander of the armed forces and took on the title of Leader of the Revolution, or Brother Leader. 
Despite Gaddafi formally leaving his official role in the state, he and his inner circle continued to wield complete control of Libya. In essence, Gaddafi had moved the real state power in Libya beyond the control of the people and into the select group that was Gaddafi's inner circle. To further support himself and his regime, Gaddafi began forming the Revolutionary Committee's Movement, a paramilitary body that was officially organized in 1979, but had already been partially formed as early as 1976. Initially on university campuses, these groups were formed out of students, filled with fervor for the revolution, and given the task of rooting out and removing dissidents within Libya's several universities, regardless of whether they were staff or students. Gaddafi declared in 1978 that these revolutionaries were to be everywhere, secret or public, to carry out the duty of urging the masses to revolt in order to seize power and to destroy any organization that stands in the way. In sum, Gaddafi had created his own secret police, who armed with devotion to Gaddafi's revolution, would root out any and all detractors of the regime before they became a threat. Gaddafi christened these new recruits the prophets of the age of the masses. Soon, Gaddafi endowed these committees with absolute control of selecting leadership of the local people's committees and congresses. In order to carefully manage these revolutionaries to protect himself and the regime, Gaddafi created the Revolutionary Committee's Liaison Office, a supervisory board filled with family members and members of his family's tribe, all people who had a deep-seated interest in Gaddafi's survival. Shrewdly, Gaddafi placed one of his relatives and most loyal supporters, Muhammad Majtoub, at the head of this office and barred communication between the revolutionary cells. Everything had to come through the central office, thus protecting Gaddafi from an internal revolt. The former revolutionary was not interested in dealing with a coup against himself. As revolutionary committees spread throughout Libyan society, they infiltrated schools, committee rooms, the workplace, and media centers. The decline of the free press resulted in a state-controlled stream of propaganda into the homes of ordinary Libyans. No one reporter or news broadcaster was allowed to gain too much popularity before their removal by Gaddafi. In essence, Gaddafi and his new band of revolutionaries had reformed society to create a world where Libyans were disconnected from the outside world and the reality of their own world. By 1980, the isolation of Libyans was almost complete, as Gaddafi's revolutionary committees were instructed to liquidate any and all opponents of the revolution. Gaddafi's followers launched a wave of terror in an effort to root out opposition. Thousands were arrested and a climate of fear settled onto the populace of Libya. Not even the various imperial colonizers had been able to achieve such absolute control of Libyan society. Countless horrific stories could be told of the oppression and the terror that faced Libyans throughout the rest of Gaddafi's reign. Public executions and televised interrogations cemented in the minds of many the understanding that to fight was to suffer and to die. No one, it seemed, had the capacity to challenge the regime. As his agents worked to quash any resistance, Gaddafi's economic policies were further crushing the minimal prosperity that had been gained prior to his rise to power. The devaluation of the Libyan dinar, the confiscation of private property, and the destruction of private commerce and trade caused untold havoc on the Libyan economy. Under Gaddafi's instruction, the state moved into occupying all aspects of Libyans' lives. Consumer shortages were common, and what little imports made their way into the state-run supermarkets were often poor quality. Gaddafi and his regime also banned private doctors or lawyers, forcing all within those professions to work for the state. As private sector jobs were crushed and squeezed out by Gaddafi's policies, the majority of Libyans turned to the state for jobs. Controlling all of the oil revenue, Gaddafi and his followers were more than happy to expand the state apparatus to provide more jobs, many of which were pointless desk jobs. The government provided everything – work, healthcare, welfare, a home, a car. Yet the people were still poor, and public servant salaries were frozen in 1981 and remained so until the late 2000s. The result of Gaddafi's state-run economy was poverty and astronomical amounts of waste of public funds. Gaddafi's policies not only hurt the cities, but also the rural regions of the country, as he encouraged increased production, which resulted in depleted water stores and overused lands. 
Libyans throughout the 1980s and into the 21st century suffered from their leaders' ideas and revolution. As Gaddafi set to transform the economy in the 1980s, he used the military as part of his toolkit. Having long been a heavy spender when it came to weapons, buying large amounts of weapons from the Soviet Union, Gaddafi sought to strengthen his nation and regime by militarizing the majority of Libyans, beginning in the schools. Military uniforms and military topics were compulsory at the nation's schools. Students were in essence drafted into the military, whether it was attempting to buy nuclear weapons or irrigating miles of desert for farmland or buying off segments of the population, Gaddafi plowed forward with a relentless determination and pride. He ruled Libya with an iron fist, creating official positions, removing positions, merging government offices, establishing new ones. All came under the direct command of the brother leader, and Libyans throughout the nation understood that they depended on Gaddafi for survival. Gaddafi was not content with only controlling Libya. A true radical, he believed that his revolution and his forces ought to make their power felt abroad, while causing concerns among American leaders that his state was aligned with the Soviet Union, nothing could be further from the truth. Gaddafi wanted Russian guns, but he saw Russia as an imperial power, one to be resisted and eventually destroyed. Gaddafi wanted all to see him as a helper of the oppressed and those resisting colonialism. However, more importantly, he saw himself as a revolutionary for the Arab world. He believed that his revolution held the answers to crushing Israel, expelling Westerners, and returning the Middle East to its former glory. His attitude and plans to conquer Israel were mocked and resented by rival leaders, who were frustrated with the young hothead from Libya. He further enraged fellow Arab leaders when at a celebration in Libya in June of 1970, Gaddafi threatened the visiting foreign dignitaries, including his hero, Egyptian President Nasser, with revolution if they did not unite together. Nasser angrily slammed his fist on the table and ordered Gaddafi to shut up. Though briefly reminded of his place, Gaddafi was undeterred. He believed that upon Nasser's death in 1970, he himself would hold the place Nasser had occupied in international politics. He also declared that Libya, and by extension himself, would be the catalyst in unifying Arabs everywhere into a single nation, much as Prussia had unified Germany and Piedmont had unified Italy. While the rest of the region had moved on from the vision of a pan-Arab nation, Gaddafi clung to this vision with a tenacity which characterized the rest of his life. In speeches and in his writings, Gaddafi constantly envisioned his nation leading Arabs to a brighter future. As other leaders across the region resisted his efforts to unite their countries with his own, Gaddafi began working behind the scenes to destroy those who opposed him. During the 1970s and 1980s, Gaddafi was accused of helping orchestrate an assassination attempt on the Tunisian Prime Minister Hadi Nouira and supplying and training rebel Tunisians who attacked a mining town near the Tunisian-Libyan border. When France sent aid to help Tunisia, Gaddafi allowed mobs to attack and burn the French embassy in Tripoli. He supported an attempted coup in Morocco, as well as one in Sudan, and had attempted to foment rebellions in Egypt. As his fellow Arab leaders sought to quell the firebrand revolutionary, Gaddafi only intensified his efforts. He angered fellow Arabs by supporting the Iranians and Iraqi Kurds against Saddam Hussein, Iraq's nationalistic leader, and considered one of the Middle East's leading Arab figures in the 1980s. Gaddafi, ironically, considered Hussein a thug and did everything in his powers to fight him. Furthermore, Gaddafi saw the Iranians as far more anti-Western than many Arabs, a prime virtue in his eyes. However, one area he did agree on was supporting the Palestinians. With his oil money, Gaddafi bankrolled a wide range of Palestinian groups and sought to particularly support the most radical and militant groups during the 1970s and 1980s. He founded camps dedicated to training Arabs from across the Middle East in fighting the State of Israel and established what he termed the Jihad Fund to finance military action by Palestinians. For Gaddafi, terror was a legitimate weapon to be used in fighting the State of Israel. Even in his views on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Gaddafi was too radical and led many Arabs to view him as a ludicrous and insane leader. 
As Gaddafi worked to stir up the Middle East, he also began using his oil money to buy political capital in Africa and across the globe. Gaddafi was determined to be seen as a leader who supported the weak against the strong. He funded communist insurgents in Italy and Japan, Muslim insurgents in the Philippines, the Irish Republican Army, Basque separatists, and dozens of other movements in the Americas. However, a large chunk of his oil funds went to his ventures in Africa. Gaddafi first sent Libyan dollars and troops to aid the Ugandan dictator, President Idi Amin, who was locked in a conflict with Tanzania in 1972. He continued to support Amin even as international opinion darkened and Amin's forces were routed. In 1978, Gaddafi sent 2,500 Libyan soldiers to the rescue of his ally, only to learn that his troops had been completely routed. Gaddafi also began aiding Emperor Jean Bedel Bokassa of the Central African Republic, especially after his conversion to Islam in 1976. Gaddafi channeled millions to Bokassa, only to learn that the monarch had returned to Christianity. Still, he continued to support the emperor and fed the cash-strapped dictator funds to continue his ruthless rule of the Central African Republic. In the same way that he erratically funded tyrants, he also provided support to anti-colonial and anti-apartheid movements throughout Africa, including Nelson Mandela's African National Congress. Gaddafi became a force to be reckoned with in Africa, and many leaders came to take the dictator of Libya seriously. However, his most notorious interference was in the African nation of Chad, as he supported Muslim rebels in their bloody civil war against the Christian government. By the 1980s, the war had turned against the Muslim rebels, to such a point that their leader, Gokoni Oedi, began to seek for peace. Gaddafi refused to allow the conflict to stop and attempted to arrest Oedi while he was in Libya. The results were disastrous. The people of Chad collectively turned against Gaddafi and began marching towards Libya. Between 8,000 and 10,000 Libyan soldiers, many of whom were conscripts, were killed in the fighting, which lasted until September of 1987, when Chadian soldiers moved into Libyan territory. Not only did the war end in a disastrous defeat, but it also led to many Libyan soldiers defecting to Chad and joining the Libyan opposition. The war was costly, but Gaddafi seemed to care little about the repercussions. While pouring funds into various projects across Africa and the Middle East, Gaddafi remained steadfastly committed to overthrowing imperialism in any form, be it from the West or from the Soviet Union. By 1977, Libya had completely alienated the United States of America's leadership, who saw Gaddafi as sponsoring terrorism and insurgency. Relations further soured as Gaddafi created an international arm to his secret police which he titled the International Mataba to resist imperialism, racism, and reactionary forces in 1982. Headed by Musa Kusa, one of the most feared men in Libya, this new force was tasked with spreading Gaddafi's revolution abroad and punishing those Libyans outside the country who dared to challenge Gaddafi. Based out of Libyan embassies, Gaddafi's revolutionaries began looking to round up those they termed stray dogs or Libyan dissidents. Gaddafi was paranoid that perhaps those anti-regimists would topple his creation, and he sought to brutally suppress them, even going so far as to tolerate plane hijackings and attacks on foreign soil. However, even before the establishment of the international Mataba, Gaddafi's people were at work trying to silence the opposition. In April of 1980, two Libyan expatriates, Mohamed Ramadan, a Libyan journalist with BBC's Arabic service, and Mahmoud Abu Nafa, a lawyer, was shot and killed in London. Soon afterwards, more murders of Libyans occurred in Italy. When foreign opposition mounted, Gaddafi brushed the international anger aside. He had once stated, some people will die and people will forget about them, but the result will be that right will triumph, good will triumph, progress will triumph. This type of attitude, combined with Gaddafi's support of terrorism and ties to the Soviet Union, earned him the ire of US President Ronald Reagan, whom Gaddafi derided as a second-rate actor. Reagan called Gaddafi the mad dog of the Middle East and saw his meddling in world affairs as a proxy for Soviet ambitions. Even prior to Gaddafi's founding of the international Mataba, Reagan had broken off diplomatic relations in 1981 
and had approved US planes to shoot down two Libyan aircraft in a dispute in the Gulf of Serte. Tensions throughout the 1980s were sky high between the United States and Gaddafi. Gaddafi, never one to back down to a challenge, particularly a challenge from the West, continued to brazenly support revolutions throughout the globe. Gaddafi had made many foes over the years, not the least being the United States of America. In the 1970s and 1980s, Gaddafi enraged Sunni Muslims for his declarations that rejected anything outside of the Quran. Furthermore, his religious views often maddened local and international Muslim leaders, who condemned Gaddafi's actions and labelled him a heathen. While religious leaders abroad continued to denounce Gaddafi, local religious leaders suffered house arrest, persecution and death for defying Gaddafi's religious views. Many others chafed at the brutality and lack of freedom in the Libyan state. Outside of Libya, Gaddafi had alienated many leaders in the Middle East and Africa, who saw him as a threat. In the West, the reactions to Gaddafi were mixed. Some favoured ignoring the man, particularly those leaders of nations that were most dependent on the flow of oil coming from Libyan shores. Others, such as leaders in the United Kingdom and the United States, saw Gaddafi as reckless and dangerous to humanity. After a bombing in a Berlin nightclub killed several Americans, Americans revealed that Gaddafi had been behind the attack. On the 15th of April 1986, 10 days after the nightclub bombing, 18 US F-111 bombers launched an attack on Libya, dropping around 60 tons of bombs throughout the country. Gaddafi was aware an attack would be coming, the Italian Prime Minister tipping the middle-aged revolutionary off about the United States' plan. While the targets were largely military targets, or the Gaddafi compound, some stray bombs landed in civilian areas, killing a number of civilians. Gaddafi himself was nearly a casualty. However, the attack was a warning to Gaddafi to tread carefully. The raid humiliated Gaddafi and demonstrated his military's weakness, despite all the funds he had lavished on it. The raid also opened a door for Gaddafi's internal opponents to try and overthrow the dictator. Little support for Gaddafi arose from the people, and though the attempted insurrections were put down, Gaddafi was aware there were cracks in his power. However, to the outside world, Gaddafi put on a show of stepping up his saber-rattling against the US. In September of 1986, Gaddafi threatened to raise armies throughout the globe to put a fire under the feet of the United States. In 1987, he threatened to unleash freedom fighters, who would die heroes as they fought the United States. He famously stated that, Yankees have no morals, they have no conscience, they should not be treated as humans. While Gaddafi raged, many Arab leaders failed to demonstrate resounding support for the leader from Libya. Many agreed with the United States' assessment that Libya should be treated as a pariah on the world stage and that Gaddafi was a lunatic. Despite these feelings, no one did anything to halt Gaddafi. Increasingly isolated by the end of the 1980s, Gaddafi's revolution was grinding away the lives of his people at an alarming rate. Following the bombings in 1986, a combination of US sanctions and dropping oil prices inflamed an already bad economic situation. Food and medicine became harder to come by, and many turned to an already expensive black market. The terrible situation in Libya prompted increased resistance to the regime and greater coordination between the various Libyan opposition groups sheltered outside of Libya's borders. Gaddafi was a revolutionary radical, but he was not a fool. Sensing mounting tensions in his nation, Gaddafi began to implement some surface-level reforms to appease the masses. He launched attacks on the revolutionary committees that had for over a decade done the majority of the work keeping Gaddafi in power through terror and intimidation. Gaddafi staged productions of his releasing political prisoners and of publicly criticizing the revolutionaries. Other reforms were likewise surface-level, ignoring the greater, more pressing problems in his nation. He also reversed some of his more aggressive socialist policies, particularly those which had targeted private business and companies, as well as the ban on private trade. Still, many Libyans remained wary after having watched the radical changes in their leaders' stances. While economic changes in the early 1990s eased some of the most pressing problems, a new wave of challenges flowed rapidly onto Libya's shores. On the 27th of November 1991, 
the United States and United Kingdom called for Libya to surrender two of its citizens that were believed to be part of the bombing of a Pan-American World Airways flight over the Scottish town of Lockerbie, which killed over 260 people, as well as to accept Libya's role in the atrocity and pay indemnities. Predictably, Gaddafi was outraged, though later sources indicate that the Libyans were only a part of a larger terrorist plot. Gaddafi launched a series of highly explosive speeches, claiming himself to be the victim and the sole defender of Arabs and of oppressed peoples across the world. However, threats of American and British sanctions terrified Gaddafi. Knowing full well how dire the economic situation was in Libya, Gaddafi made some conciliatory gestures and pled with the United Nations to intervene. Gaddafi even shared his involvement with terrorist groups in hopes of obtaining Western goodwill. Such efforts came too little, too late, and on the 31st of March 1992, the UN Secretary Council accepted Resolution 748, which launched a host of sanctions against Libya. However, while the sanctions and asset freezes that came in 1993 hurt the Libyan economy, European states such as Italy, Spain and Germany helped protect the main source of Libyan wealth, oil. These states, the largest importers of Libyan oil, lobbied hard and successfully to prevent the United States' suggestion of sanctioning the Libyan oil industry. Gaddafi, at least for the moment, could retain control of events. As the sanctions began to take effect, unhappiness in Libya rose. The terror of the Gaddafi regime and the lack of basic necessities led some Libyan officers to begin plotting to stage a coup. Having come into contact with Libyan opposition groups in Germany, these officers began laying the groundwork for a coup in a similar manner to Gaddafi's own plotting decades earlier. However, unlike the monarchy, Gaddafi took no chances. On the 11th of October 1993, the conspirators were arrested and the plot extinguished as quickly as it had begun. What angered Gaddafi most was that many of the officers were from a tribe considered to be close allies. Gaddafi determined to make an example that few would forget. As their interrogations were broadcast on TV, Gaddafi forced the would-be revolutionaries to claim they were stooges of the United States. And cunningly, Gaddafi forced their own tribe to punish them and their families. The loyal elements of the Werfela tribe, which many of the conspirators had been a part of, set about destroying the homes of the revolutionaries and terrifying the family members connected to the conspirators. Finally, in January 1997, the horrific drama ended when six officers were executed by firing squad and two civilians hanged. Other dissidents emerged, though these came not from the military, but rather from militant Islamic groups who were determined to destroy what they saw as the heathen Gaddafi state. Gaddafi was shocked, given the emphasis his revolution had placed on incorporating Islam into the social structure. He watched warily as the neighboring state of Algeria plunged into civil war in the 1990s as Islamist elements rebelled against the army. In Libya, underground groups of Islamist activists were launching their own revolution. In the 1980s, growing numbers of activists publicly denounced Gaddafi, and despite the brutal crackdowns, more and more of the Libyan population became sympathetic. After a failed jihad by local militants in 1989, Gaddafi spent the 1990s cracking down through mass arrests, which inevitably led to torture and brutal suppression. Gaddafi also launched a speaking vendetta against the Islamist movement, decrying the militants and their allies as heretics and enemies of progress. In 1995, the regime uncovered a network of Islamist cells and launched its most brutal campaign yet. Thousands were imprisoned, and those militants who escaped to the Jebel Akhtar or the Green Mountains in eastern Libya were soon engaged in a desperate fight. Many of these fighters had experience in fighting more heavily armed enemies, having served with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, fighting the Soviet Union's invasion. The rebels nearly succeeded in assassinating Gaddafi in November 1996, when a militant threw a grenade at him while he was visiting the town of Brak. In response, Gaddafi launched a scorched earth campaign, targeting anyone even remotely associated with the rebels. The revolutionary committees were once again given free reign, their atrocities being broadcast on national television. The army tightened control of the east, which turned into a security zone. 
In 1996, at the Abu Slim prison, the regime massacred 1,286 political prisoners and buried the victims in mass graves. To further heighten his control, Gaddafi in 1997 introduced the Charter of Honor, a law which imposed collective punishment on families and tribes who harbored militants, such as restricting access to water or electricity. He also economically abandoned the eastern half of the country, punishing it for its support of the Islamist rebels. Isolated even from the rest of the country, the east began to appear as a post-war zone, with abandoned and ruined infrastructure engulfing cities such as Benghazi. The brutal crackdown had pushed the resistant underground and left Gaddafi in power, but it failed to kill off the memory of the rebels. Furthermore, the record high inflation of an average of 35% made life difficult to say the least. While most Libyans suffered, well-connected elites and traders saw their wealth only rise, creating a new and powerful upper class. Corruption was rife in every part of the realm, and the social system seemed to be on the verge of collapse. The never-ending crisis of the 1990s seemed to be tempering as many nations lifted their costly embargoes on Libya in 1998. Furthermore, anti-Western protests erupted when a Scottish court convicted a Libyan of murder in the 1992 Pan Am flight incident. As American officials continued to battle with Gaddafi over his responsibility for the bombing, the dictator saw this only as confirmation of the United States imperialism and became incensed at American demands that Libya compensate the victims. However, a core group of advisors, understanding the dangers of another period of isolation, convinced their leader to work with the Americans. Still, Gaddafi declared his and Libya's innocence in the bombing, all the while terrifying Western leaders who through their spy networks knew that Gaddafi was assembling designs and materials for a nuclear bomb. These fears were laid aside following the 9-11 terror attacks in the United States and a slew of other attacks throughout the West. Gaddafi saw his moment to regain the upper hand and gleefully declared that he had long warned the West of the dangers of Islamists like Osama bin Laden. The desperate need of the West for Arab allies took a curious turn when Gaddafi condemned the 9-11 attacks and offered the United States his support. For a man who had spent the majority of his life attacking the United States, this shift was quite a turn. However, as with many other moments during his reign, his personal vendetta against Libyan Islamists took precedent over his hatred of the United States. Libya quickly began sharing all its information on Libyan Islamists, seeking to garner the goodwill of the West, even going so far as to abandon its nuclear and chemical weapons programs. Though deeply suspicious, Americans underestimated the desire that Gaddafi had to preserve his regime. Gaddafi knew that unless something was done to rectify the economic crisis, his days were numbered. By December 2003, Libya had agreed to terminate its weapons of mass destruction program and allow inspectors into the state, while some American leaders, such as Secretary of State Colin Powell, gloated that Gaddafi had been cowed by the American invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, a claim which Gaddafi furiously denied. Rumors circulated among Libyans that Gaddafi was next, which in some circles was welcomed. No one wanted the Americans back on Libyan soil, but in the same breath, many wondered if it could be much worse than having Gaddafi remain in power. Gaddafi, however, had towed the line and had brought his country back into the good books of the Americans and British. By June 2004, the US once again had diplomatic relations with Libya, and in September of 2004, the US lifted its sanctions, and by 2006, had removed Libya from its list of state sponsors of terrorism. Relations quickly evolved to be more sympathetic, and during the tenure of President Barack Obama, Gaddafi visited the United States for the first time in September of 2009 to participate in the United Nations General Assembly. Despite Gaddafi's softening stance on the West, he refused to reform and instead unleashed a renewed fervor for revolution in the 2000s. He called on the youth of Libya to reinvigorate the revolution, while promising the people that nothing in the government would change. However, he did allow more foreign investments and provide token improvements to garner the approval of the West. Some of Gaddafi's children, such as his son, Saif al-Islam, a Vienna-educated free market loyalist, were at the forefront of pushing their father to reform the crumbling state. 
However, efforts to reform were constantly hampered by Gaddafi and his allies, who were reluctant to abandon the old ways that had been at the heart of the regime for over four decades. Furthermore, efforts to reintroduce privatization into the economy failed to stop the growth of an oligarchic class that reaped the rewards of a new friendship with the West, including many of Gaddafi's children, who took excess to a new and dangerous level. Talks of democracy were cheap and never serious, though Western officials hoped and believed the rhetoric of Libyans like Gaddafi's son Saif that change would soon come. In many ways, it was all a farce. Gaddafi and most officials had no intention to change, no matter how persuasive his son or others could be. As the regime experienced this period of change, with wealth flowing once again into certain Libyans' pockets, the vast majority of Libyans never truly felt the impact of reform. Gaddafi was erratic and brutal, most depended on the state to survive, and it seemed that Libya was locked in time as a backwards anti-Western and socialist state. Tensions underneath the surface burst violently through the fabric of Libyan society when at 3.30 p.m. on the 15th of February 2011, a young lawyer from Benghazi named Fatih Turbil, who was representing the families of those men killed at the Abu Slim prison massacre in 1996, was arrested. His crime was his organizing a day of rage or mass protest planned for the 17th of February to call for reforms and a constitution. Gaddafi and his supporters were also keenly aware of the troubles brewing across the Middle East. Tunisians and Egyptians had ousted their long-term leaders, resulting in new governments. It was the start of what would become known as the Arab Spring, and Gaddafi perhaps sensed that something had to be done before his nation succumbed as well. Public demonstrations were increasing, and Gaddafi was moving quickly to cut off the viper of revolution. He condemned the Arab Spring revolutions in Tunisia, held meaningless but showy public talks with ordinary Libyans, and provided empty promises of change and increased handouts. These niceties were also accompanied by the regime's usual heavy-handed oppression of arresting and questioning potential revolutionaries. However, unlike in previous decades, where the Libyan state had snuffed out revolution before it began, Gaddafi was far too late. When word spread that Turbil, the young lawyer, had been detained, outrage swelled into direct protest, and crowds swelled the streets of Benghazi. The outside world watched breathlessly as the crowds shifted from protesters to rioters. Police stations burned and chants gradually focused not on reform, but on revolution. The people wanted the regime to end. Gaddafi unleashed his revolutionary forces on the people, killing dozens and scattering the rest on the 17th of February 2011. However, the next day the masses returned to the street, once again calling for change. As violence escalated in Benghazi, revolts in other cities began to take shape. Gaddafi moved quickly to cut off the city by disrupting internet and cell phone coverage. It proved futile. Revolution was spreading, and it was spreading fast. As protests spread to cities throughout Libya, the regime's forces worked to brutally quash any resistance. Deaths mounted and the crowds continued to grow. Swelled with Libyans tired of the violence and fear, that had been the staple of their daily lives for so long. Though shocked, Gaddafi quickly rallied his troops to Tripoli, where he hoped to begin reinstating his rule. With the nation in chaos, some of Gaddafi's old allies and one friend from his school days turned on him by joining the revolution. Never had a revolt become so serious in all of Gaddafi's time as ruler of Libya. He decided to crush the rebels in a way they would not soon forget. Gaddafi believed it was time to bring in the second Jamahiriya by announcing new changes to the old political system. The new Gaddafi inspired revolution to be fueled by the deaths of the rebels. Even Gaddafi's reform-minded son, Saif al-Islam, turned on the revolutionaries. The crackdown in Tripoli was initially successful, and soon Gaddafi and his family had tamed the revolution in the western half of Libya. The east was another matter entirely. The revolutionaries in the East established what they called the National Transitional Council, or NTC, a coalition of various groups working together to oust Gaddafi. Many of the leaders within the NTC were former Gaddafi officials and reformers who had defected once the rebellion successfully weathered the initial crackdowns. Largely technocrats who had supported reforms, the leadership of the NTC worked feverishly to unite the Libyan opposition 
into a coherent and stable camp. However, the rebels lacked arms and were lacking in military training. The initial gains of the rebel forces were quickly reversed in March of 2011, and it appeared that Gaddafi was on his way to regaining control of Libya. As his forces surrounded the rebel stronghold of Benghazi, on the 17th of March 2011, Gaddafi declared, I will finish the battle of Benghazi tonight. I will chase you flat by flat. Many onlookers feared that the city would be flooded with civilian blood. However, once again the West halted Gaddafi's plans. On March 17th, the United Nations Security Council voted for a no-fly zone over Libya and authorized the use of military action to protect civilians. The combined leadership of France and the United Kingdom was the force behind the drive to intervene in Libya and found support from a portion of the Arab League, long hostile to Western involvement. With the United States directing the intervention, French and British planes, along with other nations, began to attack Libyan forces. Gaddafi seized the moment to declare that the West was preparing for an invasion of Libya. Despite the show of force, Gaddafi was not concerned. He was determined to fight to a bloody end. As NATO forces helped the rebel forces capture the key city of Misarata, after a long and bloody battle that nearly destroyed the entire infrastructure of the city, Gaddafi increasingly circled his troops around the capital of Tripoli, and he tightened his control of the city. People disappeared daily, and regime forces marched through the city constantly. Efforts were made through his son, Saif, to negotiate with the West and the rebels, but few were interested in such talks. Gaddafi was seen as too unpredictable to be trusted. Promises of open elections and democracy seemed hollow after the months of devastation that had rained down on the civilians near Benghazi. Besides, the NTC seemed to be a model government, willing to help the people and reopen Libya. Gaddafi lashed out frequently against the NTC and condemned them as collaborators of the colonial powers. By August 2011, the rebels and their NATO allies had nearly encircled Tripoli and began marching into the city. The Gaddafi forces melted away and crowds surged into the streets in support of the revolution and ransacked his home. However, Gaddafi and his family were nowhere to be found. When rebel forces had encircled Tripoli, Gaddafi and a small convoy of loyal supporters had fled to his hometown of Sirta. The other members of the Gaddafi clan fled to sanctuaries inside and outside Libya, hoping that they could escape the consequences of their father's rule. Meanwhile, rebel forces enacted their full revenge on Gaddafi's supporters, destroying the towns of Bani Walid and Sierta. Human rights abuses were numerous, and the anger the rebels felt at not finding Gaddafi in Bani Walid led to wanton destruction of the city. The battle for Sierta dragged on well into October, the regime forces fighting desperately, knowing that surrender would result in death. Gaddafi himself remained in Sierta, surviving on rice and pasta he had scavenged from the ruins of the city. He read the Quran and made phone calls for help on his satellite phone. As he attempted to flee Sierta, a NATO flyover launched a withering attack that caught the convoy by surprise. Gaddafi was wounded in both legs and was dragged into a sewer to hide. Rebel forces soon arrived and dragged out Gaddafi, raining blows on the 60-something-year-old man pleading for mercy. Finally, a young teenage rebel shot Gaddafi, killing the once proud leader of Libya. His body was dragged through the streets of Sierta before being sent to Misarata, where his body was displayed as a war trophy. Though the NTC pleaded with the rebels to allow the body to be buried, the people refused to comply. Gaddafi was to have not a single honor or respect paid to him. The bloody man who had controlled Libya and remade it to mold his image elicited the hatred and venom of his people. Even days and weeks after his death, crowds lined up to take pictures over the next four days of the rotting bodies of Gaddafi and one of his sons. On the 25th of October 2011, Gaddafi was buried in an unknown location in the Libyan desert. The man who believed he would become the next father of the Arabs and leader of the developing world had died in a gutter, killed by a teenage boy. Though he had rained terror down on the Libyan people for 40 years, his reign ended through the will of the people, the people he always declared he was meant to represent. Muammar Gaddafi was in many ways typical of the breed of post-colonial dictators that came to prominence across much of the developing world in the latter half of the 20th century. Often claiming to rule in the name of the people of their respective countries, 
but succumbing to tyrannical and egotistical rule, brutal oppression and risky wars. As terrible as they were, there is a body of opinion that states that with the overthrow of dictators like Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein, the resulting power vacuum led to more deaths and chaos than if both men had remained in power. This assertion is countered by others, however, who state that the people of countries like Libya deserved better than Gaddafi and the road to democracy, although long and bloody, must be trod or at least attempted in the hope of building a better future. What do you think of Muammar Gaddafi? Was he a strong man and radical revolutionary forced to violence by the pressures of the West? Or was he a true tyrant who cared little for the health and safety of his people? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.